think that you know where we're at a position where we have to look at you, you can't add something without taking something else away. Um, I just want to say that I, I know we got that strong positive feedback from the teachers today, and I think that, that from my perspective, these are really important positions, and in another way, help to support the teachers um, in the classroom, you know, um, and, and their ability to serve the students. So, um, I think mean, these are positions that you know every other district that we like to measure ourselves against has these positions at both the sort of the school level the coaches position. Yeah, yeah the school level and actually the the district level um, have these positions and this is something where I think we have seen um, really we have really seen the impacts of not having this over this like last year and a half or two years due to the amount of curriculum change that we've gone through with the you know math common core and um, just, you know the, the literacy changes so I heard that loud and clear from those teachers and again I think uh, this is something that's very important. Thank you. It was actually, oh, that's great. No, I, I, I just wanted to take a, a step back for a second and it's something I probably should have said at the beginning. Um, when we began developing this budget we knew we had some constraints um, in developing this budget and when we sat down with the principals and the central office administration, we had we had two main goals in mind. One goal was to avoid cuts to the classroom, the teachers. Um, the other was to continue to improve student achievement. I think the budget that we have put forward, the two and a, well now it's about 2.75 percent <coughs> increase, has done that. Um, and at the same time, making restructuring and reductions in other areas that allow us to do this. Um, unfortunately, there are reductions that we have to make that are going to affect um, individuals, they're going to affect services in some way. When you make a cut of this magnitude, it's going to happen. It also, we're using offsets that we're a little nervous about, and we've, mm -hmm. we've made that clear as well, but the, the increase in offsets that we are proposing, we feel are offsets that are a result of something else. For example, increasing the special ed circuit uh, special ed offset is because there's a decrease in circuit breaker, which we hope next year is going to go back up because the number of students that are reaching that threshold are going back up again. So that offset we are hoping to decrease next year. So these are we strategically have put this budget together like a puzzle. Um, for the very reasons of those two goals, avoid cuts in the classroom to teachers and improving student achievement. Thank you. There was a comment in the back. I just had a question. Um, <coughs> Andrea Korvac, I'm a budget parent from Woodend. I think one of the other um, changes or, or proposed changes with the paraeducator cut was around the, the before school time, not the funded one that you know parents pay for about like right. that 10 or 15 minute window so um, for drop-off so where would that fall with the 75,000 would that would that be so that would not be restored with this so so students would not come into the school till 810 which is what it is now right 815 815 815 so right now is there like a more of an open window I, I have to be honest I, I dropped my kids up way before that so. five, okay we have a five minute window. five minute window yeah okay Thank you. All right, Dr. Doxer, question? Um, yes, actually, uh, I, I couldn't really hear the person's last question. She was asking, Mine? yep, she was, I, it, it's actually good that I repeated it, I reminded it. But the question was whether or not para hours in the morning before drop off would be affected. And okay, it, thank it, you. And the answer was, I couldn't hear any of that. And the answer was? Not being restored. They're not being restored. No, they're not being restored. So it will come down to the staff to divvy up the reception hours? No. No. No, no, no. no, no, no. It's just the drop, the before, school starts at 815 and they can drop off only five minutes before that? Yeah, 810. Mm -hmm. Versus mm -hmm. the, if the, if the paras, if there was funding and we had paras, then they could be there and parents could drop off eight eight, at eight, eight, eight o'clock or, mm -hmm. and we don't have that. So the para funding that was, sorry, was restored was 
much more focused um, in the classroom, the kindergarten, and really in, the, in lunch and to, to some teacher and office support that uh, I think offloads copying and other tasks like that so the teachers can stay with students. Great. Thank you very much for reiterating that. Yeah, fine. Mr. Knight? I thought we would, that was one of the areas we were not going to be able to restore. I think it's a part of that, right? Yeah, no, it is restored. What not restored is, is there's some less office coverage and some still somewhat less classroom, classroom support. support. Yeah, for teachers. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Martha. I that concluded the update on the, uh, the good news around the 75,000. Um, continued, continued discussion in the school group? I, I do have another question. Certainly. Uh, please forgive me because I can't see if someone else is starting to talk. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine, Dr. Doctor, thank you. Um, so my question actually relates to paraeducators again and the relationship to question 99. We have had a discussion that has clarified my concerns about the standardized testing and the role of paraeducators and the cost of standardized testing to, to the district, but I thought it might be helpful that was articulated as well at the school, school committee meeting. So the question she's referring to, um, we, Mrs. Doxer asked, Dr. Doxer asked if we pay for PARC and MCAS testing. We, we do not. The state pays for PARC and MCAS testing. But they do not pay us dollars for the time that the teachers are administering these tests. Like that time that it takes to do the tests, the state's not giving us money. Like here's your stipend for doing a park test. Well, no. it's during the school day. Right, but only it's an opportunity cost in my in my mind. Right. It's something we have to do. It's mandated. Teachers. Correct, but we don't pay for the actual is, test. And right. there was some confusion. Oh, okay from mem some members of the community that we do pay for the park and the MPS, which we do not. But all that work and analysis of data and everything is done as part of the standard, I don't want to say standard data, but part of the work that teachers and administrators do. Mrs. Yes. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Doctor. As I understand it, too, the park, given that it's online, will help alleviate some of the pressure some of the extra work that previously has been on the administration in the schools and their paraeducators and organizing and assembling and sending. Yes, so that, that, that is correct. The demand, I'm sure the principals could paraeducators that are no longer <laughs> there, that will be helpful. So, Dr. Doxer, there are uh, elementary teachers uh, shaking their heads. Principals. Uh, principals. principals, sorry. <laughs> principals uh, shaking their heads. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I agree. Thanks. Yep, that's fine. Mrs. Grosky? Thank you. Um, I, I have a question about, actually, I have a comment and a question. The comment is that I think that the restructuring that's proposed in this budget is really, really thoughtful and student centered, and I appreciate it. So, I'd like to say that. Um, my concern, so that the side to that, the other side to that is sustainability. So in your presentation to us a few weeks ago, and Dr. Doherty, we stated that FY17 revenues look this month, and we're looking at significant cuts next year if that doesn't change. My concern about creating two instructional coach positions is they're not student-facing. And while I'm 100% behind us as the way to professional development embedded in the classroom in the district as opposed to outside workshops or bringing people in, I'm very much on board with this. My concern is, are these positions sustainable in FY17 if revenue projections don't change? And my reason for asking the question is, I don't want to, I don't want to be in the position next year with these positions that we're in this year with the parents. Sure. Um, two comments. One is, we could be using those positions right now, and I, and I think the data shows we could be using those positions right now. So. For, for you know whether whether they last a year, whether they last two years, whether they last five years, we need them now. Um, so I think that's that's the first piece that that's important to know. Um, the second piece is I, I think we have to look to see what what are going to be the reductions we're going to need next year before we even have that conversation. 
I mean, I was part, and I think you were on the committee when we had the last override, mm -hmm. operational override. I mean, we were looking at three and a half million dollars in cuts in 2003. When you're cutting three and a half million dollars from a budget, which now is probably going to be a lot, would be a lot more exponentially. Everything is on the table, so I, I think we have to wait to see what that would look like before we even go down that road. Um, I mean, I, I am concerned. I mean, I've said this. I'm very concerned about FY17. I think we all are. The town manager has said the same thing. But in terms of these positions, I mean, right now we need them. So I think they're going to be put to good use, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to help us. Of course, thank you. Just to follow up on that, I, I hear you, and I actually agree. Um, but the one piece of what you said that I'm struggling with is that even if it's only for a year, I actually think that can be problematic in the school, to, to bring in a structure, to bring in coaches, and to establish they're going to be at the school on Monday, the school on Tuesday, and establish all this. But potentially a year from now, we're going to take that support away. I'm not sure it is. I genuinely am not sure that that is worth it. Because that's sort of what's happening with the Paris. This is how we do business now. We don't. We're doing something else. I'm just a little well, worried about sustainability. Our intent is to have these positions sustainable. Okay. Because this is professional development. We've had professional development for years. So now we're replacing professional development funds for these positions because they are going to become our primary source of professional development. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, so I just want to follow up a little bit on that and kind of, so um, when the specialist curriculum specialists that were added back probably after 2003 um, were added in, and I, people probably, there's probably a few people in the room who know, remember how bad it was then. But even at that time, when they were added back in, the fact that we had got them back in for a couple of years was such a benefit. And I'm glad that we, you know, we, even at that time, we were going through the same dialogue. Well, we're not going to be able to keep them, you know, or we don't know how long we'll be able to keep them, so not, don't do it. That was not, you know, that, that reasoning would have stopped us from putting in place some really important resources that we had for a number of years. And it was it still as it was it was terrible when we were then cutting those positions out. But I, I look at where we make decisions more about um, and the gosh darn um, middle school science curriculum has been one of those that we, we 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 exactly make this decision because it's the kind of thing that you have to have sort of like a three year commitment or two or three year commitment to implement a curriculum. And if you can't see that path, it makes you stay stopped. Um, so, and, and or it pushes that into lower priority. Uh, so I look. I think that there's some things that, you know, we we could be doing. Whether you look at as a science curriculum or um, some of the health and wellness areas that we would like to continue to be, you know, supporting. That we're making a decision that we can't do right now because of exactly what you're talking about. And I think when you're making especially like if it was the um, health or science, those are things that then directly impact the students. So I think we do have to think about, you know, we don't want to start engaging, especially engaging the students in something new and then have it retracted. But this, this is, if, um, if we're in a position next year where we have to cut these positions again, these positions will have enriched um, the teachers and, and then those teachers will have impacted students. So we will have had a year of, of doing that. And so, you know, I just really feel like these are critical and I really respect the uh, feedback that we got from teachers today. Mr. Knight? Yeah, so I just want to make it clear that uh, I've talked to Dr. Darty about this when I first came on. Um, I'm fully supporting um, the need for whatever it's uh, instructional coaches or curriculum director. Uh, I think it's something with black I've seen it work in other districts <coughs> actually, you know, played that role in the district. And I think it's uh, you know one that we really really need. But it almost sounds like we're balancing that against the power educators right now. I'm not sure if that's the intent. You know, it sounds like that. But I'm not necessarily willing to do that, but I, I still contend that the power educators play a key role in our schools and um, I think any cut from them, it, it, inevitably, we end up putting it back. I've seen it happen historically, um, you know, just as we talked about sustainability. Um, can we continue these instructional coaches? Can we continue to run the buildings with less power educators? I, I contend we can't. I've seen that firsthand. 
So that's my only point. I'm not saying you know, don't don't fund them. instructional coaches. Greg and I have had discussions about the value of it. I, think it's, uh, I would like to see um, you know more depth in terms of how they're being used and you know what we'd be looking for in terms of uh, you know skill set with those coaches. I think that's really important. I've seen a little bit and Greg did respond to the email I sent them. But I'd still like to see more. But that said, you know, I'm, I'm in support of them. But if we're balancing it against our educators, you know, I'm still going to our educators. Thank you. Um, Mr. Martin, can I just on that? I'd like to comment on that too, because in no way did we ever intend there to be a either or sort of thing. It was a completely separate conversation. Oh, I don't think you, you're yeah, doing that. Yeah, I'm just realizing like the now. nuts and bolts of what we're talking about now comes off that way. Um, but we really looked at, especially in light, to be very candid, uh, the level three status and hearing a very direct, you know, clear directive from the community and looking with the, the EPA community, the task force and on, to address that issue. We were really looking at some of the root issues. Um, and so for us, that was a completely separate, how can we use existing funds? How can we increase our capacity as a district without increasing our, you know, our budget? Um, but how can we use funds differently to better support our teachers in, what, in the work that we're trying to do? In one of the, um, it's called the, the um, CSC, the Conditions of School Effectiveness, school effectiveness the survey, excuse me, I have a cold, my brain's not working so well. Um, I'm Tom Brady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> people are more concerned about Tom. <laughs> I say, I am too. Um, <laughs> But one of the things that was very clear in that, in our input from staff about that, that you know, that's very research evidence-based um, you know, information about what, what do school systems really need to have in place right now to make sure that the students um, perform well. And those areas, there are several indicators in there that have very specific questions about are we using funds to support teachers in this way with embedded work in the classroom with coaches. And across the board, in that survey, also in a MASCAL survey for the last year, that that was some of our lowest ratings. So that's why that was put as a high priority. How can we re channel some of these funds in order to do that? Um, so all that was done separately from that, and we were really pleased that we were able to find ways to do that um, successfully. And then, of course, we had to sit down and say, okay, now we're facing some cuts. What do we, what do, we need to do? I mean, I would never want to be in a position where we're also, I mean, to, to Pit one against the other, we would also be saying we're going to, you know, be cutting a, a large portion of professional development for teachers as we go forward, whether it's become a coaches or something else, which I think would have a tremendous impact um, on our students, let alone getting us out of the level three status, which I don't think that we want to do. So um, I certainly hope that it can be sustained. That would be our effort. My, my fear is as we look ahead to future fiscal years, but our, our concerns would go well beyond those two decisions. Um, but let's hope that we will do that. Mr. Robinson. I, I, Craig, you just said one of the things that was, has been one of my concerns. And, you know, we're redeploying uh, professional development monies for all of the district now to, to the Eaton situation of the level three situation uh, and you know that's a focused area and my concern one of my concerns with that is you know I'm not sure where the task force is at this point but we're responding to I guess part of their findings at this point and not uh, and not when it's complete uh, and uh, I guess for people who don't know, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm not an expert in what a curriculum specialist is, and uh, num first of all, I'm concerned that we just got a memo. Uh, I mean, the RTA put themselves out there with coming to the meeting and saying, I would have appreciated them coming to, to uh, advocate for what they wanted as opposed to the memo, but that's that that's not a big deal uh, but 
the curriculum rules. Oh. The, you know, what are the what aren't what can they do that the co what what can they do that the coaches uh, are going to be doing? Is there anything they can do more than what can who the curriculum specialists? The leaders, the, the leaders. curriculum leaders. Leaders. That's That's time teachers. Those are really in the classroom, so they're doing a lot of the work in our PLCs, our professional learning communities, and the service time and so forth. They facilitate that work with the teachers, but they would certainly work closely with the coaches. Um, and the coaches would be helping to plan um, professional development, they'd be working in the classrooms, they'd be doing modern lessons and things, um, co-teaching. We've been talking with other districts that have some really good um, models in place to see how exactly do people spend their time, what do they do, what kind of job description should we, should we create. Um, most districts have more than these positions, I think it would be hard to find a different end, just this. Um, and I, didn't, I certainly didn't mean to imply that this is designed only to address the deep situation. I mean, even the, the curriculum leaders that wrote John an email, they're from across the district. I mean, they feel that those in, in a concert with the collaborative organizational structure we put in place will be very effective as we move forward in getting the results we want with kids. Um, my fear is that it's not just for me, but I don't want to go to school. That we have to make sure that we're able to bring everyone to this level. And all the research says this is a very, as it's already been stated, this is a, the most effective way to do that. So it's able to take any external professional development, anything that's being done, and it actually gives the, the teachers a chance then to apply it with somebody in the actual practice. We can have online discussions about that. Have somebody help you develop the voice and like that. But, but we, we know, we talked about the other night, that, again, as I say, all of this professional development money is being <coughs> redeployed to these two positions. And these two positions aren't going to have any impact on middle school or high school students for the foreseeable future. And, and that's only if we have the sustainability. So, uh, you know, we're, we're I'm cons I'd, I'd be happier if the task force came to me and said, you know, you know we just don't have enough money to do what we, we need this money for this as opposed to taking it from somewhere else, taking it from other kids or other programs and redeploying it to a, a, a target, just one little target area. I don't think this is just one little target area, Chuck. This is this is K to eight math and K to eight literacy. That's those are pretty big areas. Right. And, and it's not it's I not the content. it's not just the Josh Wheaton task force that's proposing this. I mean this is something that was been on call was a spade, a spade. No, it, this is something we put in last year's <coughs> budget book that we wanted uh, we felt was important. Um, in the list of priorities. I mean this is something that other school districts have had for several years that Reading has not had. Um, it, then it's needed. It really is. It, it was needed, I mean, it was needed last year. It was needed when we were putting in the new math program at the elementary. And we didn't have, we don't, we didn't have the, the, you know, the bandwidth to do it. I mean, these are necessary positions. And, and what Craig said is true. Our fear is, is that if we don't get this type of coaching support for our teachers, that the consistency level across the district is going to continue to be different, and we have other schools that could be put in a position that Eaton is in this year. And, and I, I hear that, but my and then what I heard though is that maybe I misheard it, but that these coaches will probably be spending a fair amount of their time at Eaton for the next. No, see it no, would be, it would be equal across all of the. I think their focus for the first couple of years would be more elementary than middle, even though they're K-8, they'll provide some leadership for the transition. But no, their goal would be to have them equally among the elementary schools, so that all of the students get a, the same firm foundation. Just so that the board knows, the RTA supports those two positions because of the, the coaching, the direct um, impact with, with the teaching staff. Um, just as a point of clarification, Mrs. Webb, um, I appreciate that you've had the opportunity to talk with 
um, teachers in the district, and I, I was unaware that that was going on today, I think you said? They, the letter that no, they got, sent they sent me an email today. They sent an email? Oh. Which I shared with the committee earlier. And, and no. so the, the curriculum, they are curriculum leaders. Can you clarify the, is there classroom teachers? I recognize the names. They're all classroom, classroom teachers. teachers. Mm -hmm. So do they, this curriculum leadership role that they have is, um, but they're still full-time teachers versus like at the high school you have a science Yeah, these are full-time teachers. And these, they have a somewhat less simple. <clears throat> these are positions that oversee our PLCs okay. that meet after school and during early weeks. Right, so it's sort of, it, it's um, the full-time teachers, classroom teachers, but this is also a title that they have, a responsibility mm -hmm. that they have in addition to the full-time classroom teacher. Right. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that there is no reduction in the classroom teaching responsibilities no. for these folks. No, this is above and beyond. Right. So one, one comment, so I do, I do think, you know, looking at uh, MCAT scores, there were other schools that really weren't all that far away from that one. So, you know, I do support it, but, um, you know, I'm still, I'm still, no, no, uh, uh, minimize the impact it could have at the middle school, but I really think it's, I've seen a more, I've seen them in the K through five more than I've seen in K through eight. That's what I've seen in other districts. Um, and I know Christ is probably spending more time in I can almost see, um, I'm most rather see them keep it by and then grow forward. Um, you know, we implement them at the middle school, uh, specifically in those grade levels. But um, you think that you know, they, they, they can have a big impact in K through five. I do think also, too, there could be a cost savings there, too. If I look at that, the salaries that I think we budgeted is about $75,000. I'm assuming we're probably going to take people that we know are proficient in you know, demonstrated exemplary teaching in those areas. And within our district, we don't, A, you know the curriculum, B, you know the people that we're going to be and have the respect. As, as opposed to someone coming in from the outside, not to say that, that couldn't happen, but there could be some costs that we can even replace those teachers. Um, at a lesser salary, um, if you know. Yeah, I, I, I don't even want to speculate who these people would would be. I, I think we want to get the best people, you know, and that could be internal, it could be external. Well, I would, I would, I, I can see that perspective on it, but I think looking at it um, logistically, I think it would probably make no sense. But I mean, I'm not telling you to hire them, but I do think we get cost savings in that. If it was within if it was done internally, I, I think uh, it's something to think about. And uh, there would be a cost savings that maybe that could be redirected to parish kids. I just have to say that I think that it's this. It's important that we look uh, everywhere where there could be a high capacity person to put in these roles. They're so important, and I think that these jobs are posted. Or will, if this is approved, these jobs are going to be posted. I would think they have to be posted. Right. I, I just think um, we have to recognize we're in this public forum, and we I, I wouldn't want to, by our dialogue, then discourage some person that we don't know today who might be an amazing asset to our district from even considering the job. So I, that I mean maybe this is like my private. Um, you know, my engineering professional background speaking, but I, I think it's important <coughs> this can be posted and we need to look at every resource we have. Thank you. Dr. Doxson? I just wanted to voice my support of the idea of the uh, curriculum coaches. I think that, to me, represents teaching someone fish help someone eat for a lifetime. I think they'll be working with the PLC. I think they'll be working with the teachers. And I think that investment there will impact their grades as well. I think the PLCs, they work within disciplines. They work across disciplines and across schools, as I understand it. And so by supporting the teachers in learning and, and um, improving their curriculum, that is going to more than trickle up. So I think that they are an investment, and I think that we need to make sure that we get the best qualified people because those are the best, they're going to be the best help to the administration and the teachers along the way. So I wouldn't necessarily limit them to 
already in our district, and I'd hate to look at this as a way to save money. Um, you know, Pennywise sounds foolish. The right person for that job is going to be the best help the teachers who deserve the best because they're giving their all for our kids. So um, I love the idea of kids, and I love the idea that professional development money has been directed that way. I think it enables us to have teaching within our school and the support that will maintain the applications of what's learning and the honest evaluation of the applications of what teachers are learning. So I think it will be good for our culture. I think it will be a really rich dialogue. And I think that the instructional coaches, sorry, the curriculum coaches will also know the kids. So that will also enrich dialogue. So I guess I wanted to really reinforce the emails that I heard received today and my feeling about these curriculum coaches. My children were actually beneficiaries of the previous, those 2003 ones that were mentioned earlier, and it kept my boys engaged when they otherwise might have been bored. It worked for both kids that are struggling and those kids that are um, finding that they're not challenged enough. So I, I reinforce that. Thank you. This is gross. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a one concern I had about the instructional coaches was last year they were on our list of unfunded things we knew we needed to push for. And we don't have a list of over a million dollars of things we want and need or can't afford. The top three priorities are all directly student facing. So we would like general ed tutors, we would like social adjustment counselors at the elementary and middle school level. So when I look at that and I see that this has risen and I appreciate level three and I appreciate the need. Um, and I'm going to reiterate, I do think this is a smarter, better way to do professional development. So I'm very appreciative of that. But when I look at this unfunded list of mandates, and so many of the top priorities are directly student-facing, my question is, if there is a question in here, moving forward, immediate term, three to five years, would these two instructional coaches be sufficient? Or do you envision, as Mr. Nine said, expanding that kind of middle goal? Or if the revenue projection changed, something fantastic. Here. Do you see us going more in the direction of more? This list would suggest that the next additional hires would be student facing. So my question is, do we need more of these, or do you see these two as being sufficient? And if more revenue became available, we would be hiring more directly student centered, student facing positions. I think you're going to need both. You've got a science curriculum that we're going to need to be implementing in the next year or two, because there's new standards that are coming out. Actually, they're already out. Um, so you are going to need an instructional coach for science. Yeah. So I would say yes. I, but I, but you're going to, you're going to also need the other positions as well. Thank you. Yeah. Go for it. So we change topics totally. Charmaine. Okay. So. I would wanted to just talk a little bit about the um, athletic piece because that's on the table. When I look at the list of things that um, you know were restructured or where the money comes from, I can sort of support. Um, I just want to get to that list. So as you go down that list, in terms of where the reductions came from or the offsets, right? We've got grant writing, regular day bus transportation substitute teachers per pupil, virtual high school, EMAR. Metco offset, extended day, um, athletics, and then special ed and the power educators. So we spent a lot of time talking about the power educators, and um, thankfully we we're only talking about a $60,000 cut, not $135,000. I was on page eight way back. And then, um, so the increase in athletic and extracurricular user fees is $75,000. Well, um, no. That's an error. Sorry, it's sixty. It's sixty. Sorry, okay, so sixty. I'm looking for now. Um, so is it still the twenty-five to two hundred and fifty dollars? Yes. Up to two fifty, which is an increase of thirty-five dollars. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And the family cap from eight hundred to nine fifty, and the individual cap from five hundred to six hundred. Is that all correct? Yes. 
So I just want to say that even though it's um, probably not popular, it's it's difficult, and we've had a lot of dialogue around um, not wanting to impact participation. We've had dialogue around, um, you know, families are not just paying this fee; they're also supporting the, you know, friends of wrestling, swimming, football, everything, all the boosters, and um, making contributions or bringing pasta to pasta parties, whatever it may be. Um, I, I think that it's um, an area that we, we have to look at, and um, I support that uh, change and that increase at this time. Um, I don't have a um, I don't have a counter offer for uh, the sixty thousand dollars that this um, that this fee increase generates. So um, I'm just going to put that out there because I'm pretty sure we have to talk about it. Question from Martha. So, if we didn't do this, uh, didn't raise the fee, so mm -hmm. we still use the, uh, we still, and we didn't cut the budget by that sixty thousand. Where would that leave the offset at that point? Mm -hmm. um, no, that's okay. It would. Um it would, it would damage it. I mean, the projected yeah, end no. <laughs> <laughs> balance, um, well, with the proposed increase, we're only, if you think of it as uh, using the interest instead of the capital, we would only be eating into the balance by about $14,000 with the increase um, on athletics. I'm speaking of athletics only not because they're two different revolving funds. So we would, we'd end up um, using fifty-four thousand, we, we'd have an ending balance of about a hundred thousand, when the beginning balance of this year was um, one hundred and seventy-five. So it, it would be significant. What tables are you on for those numbers? I'm, I'm just doing quick math of pay, table one hundred four, figure one hundred four, and figure one hundred five. So uh, I, at this point, I. I don't support this for a lot of the reasons that Ms. Webb mentioned, but one of the additional ones that we talked about that I feel strongly about is I think that it, the unintended consequences of putting pressure on our coaches uh, by uh, parents expecting playing more playing time uh, you know I, I see that coming it's already there it's already happening I see it, it, it you know it, it's not this won't have any impact on participation I, I predict that I, there, we won't have any less kids if we raise the fee that's not my a concern of mine the concern is you know, the, the, you know the, it's parents are going to expect more <coughs> And maybe they should. Uh, uh, and you know, we've already talked at length about the. You know, it doesn't stop when you write the check for the uh, user mm -hmm. fee. Yeah, that's right. the beginning <laughs> right. of of the uh, the other check you have to write. I guess you know. I guess just we need to consider the coaches in that and the pressure they're going to be. So you're suggesting that we allow the um, we allow the balance of the revolving account to go down probably below, around a hundred thousand or a little below. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at or, this moment, uh, okay. I don't have as you as you in, indicated, you don't have an, an, right. another source. Or going back, going back and saying we need that that you know that's one of the priorities is you know would that be one of the, a priority if we were to go back and say if income that we you know this is a cut that we don't feel like we want to make in this that we want to put it towards now and now i'm not I'm not so sure that 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 would be where i would be yeah asking i'm not, the 60, I'm not at all that. suggesting okay. at this moment that we go back to think um, um, maybe okay. i'm saying we put our heads together and think about it a little more before we <coughs> make that decision uh, and whether it be uh, in fact I'm going to say we don't go back to pin time right. for that uh, uh, but we may have to either eat more into the uh, revolving, revolving account mm -hmm. or find the $60,000 somewhere else. Uh, 
is, is there any, was there, in that increase, is there any way that you do um, maybe one of those increases and not the other, and it gets you the revenue you would want, you know what I'm saying? So if you were to maybe not increase the um, per student, per season, but the family caps or the um, individual cap, we didn't look at. I, I really that, that's right. a, a. I I don't know if you analysis. right. I don't know if you do. You know, if you I, I do try to those pieces. You know, I did try to take into account. The, okay. No, I, I did try to take into account that there are a number of students that um, that do participate that do participate that don't pay a fee because they they have their fees waived because they mm -hmm. qualify for um, free and, and reduced lunch. And we do have to gauge that there will be so many people who will hit the cap. But mm -hmm. the num number of families and the number of students, it fluctuates from year to year, the number of kids that hit the cap, whether it's individually or as a family. Um, so it was a much higher level analysis. Right. Um, I, I did want to say just uh, you know, to follow up, you had a question last school meeting about how much we pay to MIA for our dues, and it's, it's $3,600 annually. So, uh, uh, no, not the dues. I was, uh, it just in aggregate, we oh, they okay. we mean pay the, we, they seem to be coming at us in a lot of different directions. So then we have to give them. So the thirty six hundred is dues. The dues that's, are, that's the dues yeah, that's to be a, a part, part of the MIA. Yeah. yeah. So uh, can I just, of just to just to further add to my comment about the coaches? I, I had no way I think they're doing it the right way now the way that it's high school that's and you know that's the way it's supposed to be and I wouldn't uh, expect them to do it any differently I'm just concerned that uh, not every parent's going to mm -hmm. feel that way mm -hmm. and uh, you know if you, you know our coaches are out there enough now and you know to figure out how much they were making an hour or would do it probably less than a dollar amount of time some of them put in and they don't need that I, I think that that extra aggravation uh, will could come down the road. But so the, are you saying anything just that that increase of the thirty five dollars or if the increase is an athlete so you know um, that that's that 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 would put that additional financial payment, puts that additional pressure on for the play time. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm only asking this because, and my kids have played probably different sports than your kids, so I, I my personal experience is maybe different than your personal experience too, so, but I, but I don't. I, it may not put any on. I'm, I'm saying that's one of the potential concerns. concerns. Mm -hmm. you know, no, I just haven't really thought about it. I don't know if it's just a difference in the, Sports that maybe each of us might have been exposed to, you know, that our kids participate in, or if it's, um, you know, what you're saying is sort of extrapolating beyond that. I mean, at the youth level, parents pay a fee, and they pay more probably than, than our athletic fee for some of the sports. Mm -hmm. But with that fee, they have, you know, as a coach, you have to guarantee, you know, if it's baseball. Uh, I think it's three innings a game mm -hmm. uh, and two at bats or something. If it's football, it's the next number of plays, and they get used to that. Now, once you get to the to the high school level, those rules don't exist. Nor, and I don't think they should. Right. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, that expectation uh, could carry over. Okay. Mrs. Brown. Yeah. I apologize for walking the committee back, but Martha, I just wanted to get clarification because I'm not sure I heard it right. Is what you said that if we did not increase fees for the athletic line only, the balance at the end of fiscal 16 would be about 100K, so it's roughly a Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Because, you're, it's because the suggestion that Mr. Robinson made was to still take the $50,000 offset. Exactly. The, the don't raise the revenue. And what I was trying to do is, I want to make sure I heard you right. It's about $50,000 a month. Mm -hmm. That's the Thank you. <coughs> Just to, uh, to go eat the comment you made, did we look at different levels? I, I think the one thing you really can't do is 
increase the fee but not the cap mm -hmm. because you actually in some ways may lose right. mm -hmm. money so if you're not going to increase the fee you have to you would at the very least you want to increase the cap right. you're not going to get 50,000 yeah, but you'll get some is. some smaller increment Right, and then by doing that, I don't know that that's really what you want to do because it, you put, you're putting the burden on the families, your you know, kids that are playing more. Are, are yeah, you're not encouraging more. multiple sport participation. Exactly, right. Yeah. I don't necessarily want to do that. I think it's good. There's so many sports at the high school level that kids can just try for the first time and um, and find something they love that they had no idea that they would love and be exposed to great coaches um, that that really can, we've talked about this many times before, how it, it, map, it can map over to um, just overall kind of improved health, well-being, emotional, and um, academic success. So we don't want to discourage them. But we have a $60,000 problem. A quick question about the user fees for high schools. Uh, it's the first time ever in my life someone said outside, that, thank you. Use your outside work. Um, with the participant user fees, is that something that goes up every year? Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, the last time four we, years. we four raised years student ago. user fees four years ago, and we raised them about $35 a sport. Yeah, just about that, yeah. And before that, I'm sorry that I don't have the number in front of me. Um, that one I don't know. I know. So <laughs> no, it's not something that goes up every year. Did you have a further though? No, I just, I, in part of the discussion and prior discussions about next year's fiscal budgets looking poor, if this would be an area we would be looking at anyway, and as the parent of two very active boys, I don't want to suggest this, but is it something to consider around percentage increases every year? I know a lot of youth organizations do it. I hear, you know, Mr. You know, Robinson, I hear your point about there's a lot that's associated with that, but I just guess I'm sort of throwing out in a time when Every meeting I've been to has been about we're struggling for money. Is it not a potential revenue source to sort of look at moving forward? I know you're only taxing your sort of small percentage, but I'm just trying to be creative. I, I, um, to say that I support the increase is the wrong thing. Am I going to vote for that increase? Yes. Do I support it? No. I don't want, I don't want to put our problem back on the shoulders of parents and letting. Um, and I absolutely am petrified that there's a kid who decides not to run track and sits at home and makes <coughs> bad decisions. I'm petrified about that. And I agree with Mr. Robinson that there absolutely is a point where that's going to happen. There is going to be a point where a parent says, no, I'm not spending $250. Uh, I think our mutual concern, the committee's concern is, we, we have, there, is a, there is a number and we're getting closer to it. Um, I don't think 250 is it. Uh, I, I, I've been very blessed in life, and I'm, I'm able to uh, afford that. And, and some of the sports my kids have chosen require that expenditure. And maybe I push them that way, and that's fine. Um, I I don't think 250 versus 215 excuse me, yeah. 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 is going to be the, the final straw. Uh, but I think it's something that we have to look at very carefully. And it's something that we should look at every year. I don't want us to ever. And I know what you meant, but we shouldn't look at this as a revenue opportunity ever. We should look at this as what's the least amount we can charge to offer the quality sports and extracurricular activities that we're known for. That was soapbox, I'm sorry. No, that, 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 that was sort of the point of my question, okay. so thank you. Mr. Yeah, um, yeah, so I do, I do agree with point, some points that Chuck made too, though, that um, you know, it doesn't end with the use of the um, and I think John made a good point uh, a week ago when we talked about needs and wants. Um, I do think we have to be careful, um, you know, in terms of uh, how much money we are asking from parents um, above and beyond these user fees. And uh, I know in some districts that I'm familiar with, some colleagues that I've worked with, uh, there are no sports-specific booster clubs. It's like it was back in the old days here, which was a all sports boosters club. And I'm not saying we go back that way, but I just think, you know, John made a little bit of point. Needs and wants. Do you really need this extra whatever? Uh, do you just want this extra? Are we raising money just to, you know, for the for the sake of raising money and, and making us look I mean, a little bit better than the team that we're playing tomorrow? Uh, um, you know, I think 
that's something to consider. I mean, in some sports like hockey, um, they've never paid for all their own ice time. I mean, the, the schools never pay for it. Now. somehow let, and the coaches will know that this fee has gone up, just that renewed emphasis of if there's things you need and there's things you're asking your support groups to help with, absolutely. But please do it as a new team, not a war. I, I couldn't agree with you more, so thank you for saying that. It just, it, yeah. so, and, and I'm not, and I know you're struggling with this. Just to put in the perspective, the rationale we've always used with athletic fees is that it, it pays for salaries. And the rationale for the $35 increase is because the last four years there's been incremental increases in, in stipend increases for coaches. Um, and I know sometimes the families get frustrated because maybe they don't have this piece of equipment or that piece of equipment, but user fees aren't, weren't meant to replace equipment. They're meant to support, and they close to the full full amount of the athletic <coughs> coaches. It, I, it's not. A, I'm going to say it. Anyways. I was going to say it's not worth it. But I'm going to say it. I was actually referring, and I think Mr. Nine was referring to the uh, friends of organizations. Oh no 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 no! I, I wasn't. That, I think that's all I was saying. Is yeah. I, I hope that we can let the coaches know that. Make sure they're aware. Listen, we didn't want to raise the fee. We had you. To support the coaching salaries and to make right. this a viable opportunity for our kids, please take that into consideration if you're asking for gold jet skis. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, Mrs. Weber. Sam, do you think? Yeah, no, I couldn't think of um, it. So I just, first of all, this, the one, the other thing to put in context, we have all the data is that the the fee is is still um, lower than many of our, the, our other surrounding communities. It's it's higher than some others. Um, where the tax bases in those towns are a lot different. But um, I also think it's important that we talk about like um, going forward, recognizing that we, we, we probably, if we raise this fee this year, we're probably not raising it. You know, it's not gonna be something that's gonna be on the table next year. And I'm pretty sure the, the time between raising the fees was even longer. If it was four years to this, it was even longer before that. Um, so it's something that, and, I, and I'm not saying that we should make it higher i think that this is you know this is what, what's been recommended so um and i i wondered the, the um it's two-way street with the friends of organizations and i'm sure that I mean, i've been on a number of those boards so it's as much about maybe dialogue with the parents and the coach about or the club because drama does the same thing mm -hmm. and you know what's needed here and it's it's maybe you know what what the coach is talking about and asking for, and but also what the parents are, you know, what the parents are bringing forward. And I, I guess my experience hasn't been that the coaches are asking for too much, but maybe um, parents want, we all want to have, you know, our kids to have the best, the most. We want, you know, I mean, I think we, and that's sort of natural. We want to give to them. So the parent organization, the, you know, parent organizations have to just watch that because not everyone. Not every family has the same capacity to pay for that, and there's no, um, there's no way of like those are dues or whatever they're called, right? The dues. There's no for way the that friends for the friends organizations, it's not like somebody can come and if they qualify for free and use lunch and a reduction on the athletic fee, it's not like <coughs> there's no process like that for the friends. So I think no. we have to be cognizant of that. That you know, you, there may be people. We really can't afford that. You know, Mr. O, we can't legislate what every group is doing. I mean, it's, I it, it, it's different with every group. 
uh, what they buy is different, mm -hmm. who they buy it from is different, uh, and uh, you know, no, I know, I'm sure there's families that, that can't afford it, mm -hmm. uh, but they certainly don't want to send their, their son or daughter up to the game without the, the uh, warm-up or whatever. Uh, so, uh, and I don't think that the coaches are leaning on uh, groups. I think it's, it's, a two, it's coming from both ways. I'm not suggesting this, but it might be an interesting conversation for the school committee to take up at some point and talk about would we ever discuss recommended limits to those types of organizations. I'm not suggesting we discuss it this evening, but maybe we could come up with some guidelines for friends of groups just to make sure that we are protecting families because there isn't a family in town who's going to say no. One of them. You're like saying of for uh, for those what groups, they would have to contribute to for, those for um, Dr. Doherty again a, a different conversation but guidelines for the amount of money the school committee would accept as gifts from given for particular organizations. I, just throwing it out. There. You do you do have a limit right now for <coughs> co coaching assistants. The number of coaching assistants. No, the amount per or number of per. coaching per coaching assistant. How much they they can get paid up to a certain amount. But if the tennis team wanted 50 coaching assistants and um, somehow could find we, it. we have in the past told them no if it violated Title IX. Okay. And we've okay. done that when you had sure. a complimentary sport that didn't have as many coaching assistants and we said no, you can't. I do think it's an interesting topic for the, the committee at some point. So thank you. I think the, uh, I think the coaches and the groups are still getting used to, I mean, we uh, came down on them. Mm -hmm. Four years Probably ago. not the right way to put it, but a few, well, how many years ago? It was four years ago we put in a set of uh, if we start guidelines, regulations. Regulating more, uh, you're going to have trouble getting volunteers uh, to run these organizations. Uh, but maybe a dialogue and you know with them more, more like sort of a focus group discussion with some of the presidents uh, the, you know the parent leaders of those organizations to say you know this is where we are maybe they're listening to this dialogue they're going to give us fees but I don't know if they are they're not Linda is but that's <laughs> fine <laughs> so I, you know I think it might be a dialogue and we'll have that dialogue at different meetings so we're going we're to stay focused on the budget for a second but to your point Mrs. Webb I hear an echo in my voice. Is RCTV next door? Yes. So we may oh. actually be being recorded. Oh, are they? Okay. Mm -hmm. There's no mic. <coughs> they have the mics in the ceiling. Okay. Everything you can and would say right now will be used against you. Just be careful about that. Um, a general discussion that continued on the budget. Uh, Dr. Doctor, did you have a comment? <coughs> responsibility for this uh, idea and what is mine uh, about this observation. Uh, we've talked this evening about the concern over cutting power hours and I, I get it. I 100% get it. I, I'll say that a thousand times. I do not want to cut power hours. The only point I want to make, and this can be used for or against the argument, but 
2012, our the budget was $457,000 for Paris. It went to 595, it went to 680, it went to 751 last year. We've put substantial amounts of money into the power budget year over year since at least 2012, that's what I'm looking at. Um, yes, we're reducing the budget for next year, but we're only slightly, if you look at our year over year, we're slightly taking our foot over the gas and off the gas. Again, I don't, I don't mean any disrespect for any powers that are losing hours or anyone. I just want to make the, the point that, boy, we've invested a ton of money over the years into that line item. And I'm, I'm thrilled at what we've done. What we're doing this year, in my opinion, is we have to slow it down. Our, our, our income, our, it, it isn't enough to keep going at that rate and we took our foot off the gas. I wanted to make that point. I think the other point that could be made was, wow, we've been pumping a lot of money into that budget. Why are we finding it not as important this year? That could be the other argument. I just want to make it. That's not my argument. My argument is we've done an excellent job funding powers over the years. <coughs> what we're saying is that for next year, we have to slow it down. That, that's, uh, that's why, again, being supportive is a funny thing. Uh, I'll vote for that uh, as presented by Dr. Doherty. But I just wanted to give my reasoning. I hope, I hope I came out okay. Mr. Robinson. Uh, just you probably want to dial back a couple more years from now. We cut them significantly in 2009. Mm -hmm. Correct? Is that uh, the power out the special? Primarily we did. Special? Um, well, not not actually not as or significant as when Colleen Dolan was. Well, that was special. that was special ed. I, that's why I just said special. Right, ed. that was special ed. Uh, <coughs> we cut them significantly. Special ed. We did and yes. We also had it on the block, uh, maybe 2012 budget, uh, and that was to cut hours, and we were able to get more money from the FinCom we'll at that time mm -hmm. to get it back yep. so that people uh, wouldn't lose their benefits, I believe. Right. Uh, so I don't think we've been pumping money. And I think that. Uh, the first place we go when we cut, and I said this the other night, I mean, back in my days in FinCom, the first place everyone went to cut was capital, because no one screamed. Uh, the first place we seem to go in the school budget is the Paris, and this year we're hearing, probably for the first time, loud and clear that people don't want that. So. Uh, I'd also add to that the, the, uh, the increase in cost. I think we're now closer to other districts in terms of how much we're paying them. I know um, what we were paying them previously um, you know, didn't match up with what other districts were paying for our, our paraprofessionals. Um, what I understand. So I think that could have been a cost that was well uh, implemented. But I still go back to, you know, with this huge budget that we have, we can't find $60,000 to fund it. And I know it's a tight budget. I understand what you went through. But um, I, I just think that, you know, I think they're, they're, they play a key role that, um, that we need to maintain. And um, I think we, to be perfectly honest, I think we underfund them um, in comparison to what I've seen in other districts. There's a lot more of this. In other districts, I'll see you know, paraprofessionals that are dedicated to a specific grade level in each school. You know, the grade two paraprofessional who works with those grade two teachers. We don't have that kind of, uh, as, as we don't have many things here, but and I just think it's... Just, uh, just so you know, Gary, there are also a lot of school districts that do not have them other than kindergarten. And we, okay. we actually did a little research on that. Monica, can yeah. share that with you? Um, so, uh, Wakefield Lennox... So I put out a, a, on my listserv with all my business managers just asking how they use regular ed powers, not special education, regular ed powers. Um, Wakefield, Lennox, Seacon, Triton, Wellington, use them at the kindergarten level only. That's the only place they have regular ed powers. Um, Medford has none. They don't use any. Um, Westford, the Berkshires, Hopkinton, they use a kindergarten para plus the model you just said, where they have a dedicated para at a grade level, so they do have additional paras, regular paras that support, so they have one para for all the first grade, one para for all the second grade. 
and then um, Pittsfield, and these are only the districts that responded to me. In Pittsfield, um, they only have regular ed parents at their Title I schools, but I'm unclear whether the operating budget paid for that or whether the grants paid for it. I'd like to say, I think you have to go a little deeper, though, when you're studying that, because I know that colleagues that have you know, worked with uh, other districts, uh, particularly at the elementary level, actually have duties. And I'm not suggesting that we do that by any means, but um, they take up the slack that we don't necessarily provide. There may be, you know, compensation for that. I'm not really sure, but I know that that's another consideration. I'm aware that not every district has characteristics. Right, and so this is, this is anecdotal information, yeah. not meant to be analyzed. Um, for our comparative group, I reached out to the DESC because we all report in our end of year numbers, and I wanted to get a sense of, for our communities that we compare ourselves to, where do they are spending? Because, as you know, our Paris, it, it, there's a DESC code for that line, so we, we could tease it out for just regular ed versus set. Um, so there are eight districts. So of the 13 districts, or yeah, 13 districts that we compare ourselves, eight districts spend less than $500,000 on regular ed Paris. How they're used, I don't know uh, specifically. Um, there's we're in a tier of three districts: Chelmsford, Reading, and us spend between five hundred and a million dollars. Chelmsford, which Chelmsford, Chelmsford, Westford, and Reading. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then, yeah. And then there's two districts, and these two districts, the amount of money that they spend on Paris just seems like they might be putting more in there than what they than what the other reporting districts did because Shrewsbury and Marshfield spend more than $2 million on Paris, which just didn't seem reasonable. It sounded like, um, and I, I talked to Dr. Dory about it, Shrewsbury actually said they only spent 600000 on special ed Paris and $2 million on regular, so I think there might have been a transposition there, but that's for someone at the DDSC or their auditors to look at, not me. Um, and, and Marshfield, it, it might have been Marshfield that did that. So it just seemed ex extraordinarily high. So. Eaton, Easton spends nothing. Milton spends six thousand dollars. Mansfield, eighty eighty thousand dollars. North Andover, one hundred and twenty thousand. Winchester, one hundred and fifty. Belmont, one hundred and sixty-seven. Dedham, one hundred and ninety-five. And then um, Hingham, that four hundred ninety-six thousand. So, I think what we spend on regular ed Paris is a little bit high for our comparative districts, um, based on FY fourteen. And the report data with DPSC. That's interesting <coughs> anecdotal information, but as you said, it's anecdotal. I do think that you know the way we do business here has been dependent upon our professionals, and um, I hate to see us go backwards in that regard. So, I acknowledge the I guess I don't think the DPSC data is anecdotal if that was. That was DESC data yes, from was. 2014, yeah. right? From our most current. Currently. So that's the data from the listserv is a little bit more of an anecdotal nature, but I appreciate it. And I think we, I think we have to recognize, I know there's been, we have this ongoing dialogue about the per pupil, and I appreciate that in the answers to some of the questions, we wrote that out without transportation. And I, I think it just highlights there's when we're 12th lowest out of 12, or 9th, out of the 12, ninth lowest out of 12 um, on the per pupil expenditures. There are things that we just, we have, we can't do. We cannot do them all. And so I really feel like the, for me, I think um, adding, being able to add back in what we're able to add back into the powers. I appreciate Mr. Caruso's sort of analysis of the numbers. And um, Again, I don't, I don't have anywhere to offer, and I'm not, I'm not sure that I would actually offer it there if I, if I had some money that I thought we could take it from and put it to there. But I know for sure that I will not be taking it from the uh, suggestion that we take it from the curriculum specialist, the coaches. I just think that that's too important. It's going to add a great value. Thank you. Mrs. Copeland? Um, I just wanted to make the point that um, last week when I spoke, I was saying that the uh, the substitute budget being decreased by 137,000 um, combined with that 60,000 shortfall, I hope and pray that that won't have a further impact on the paraeducator, uh, you know, 
the direct instruction in the classroom. And I am, we are so thankful that the 75,000 has been put back in. Um, yeah. So, just wanted to make that that clear. Understood. Um, I just wanted to, um, perhaps this point was brought up in the discussion with the, regarding the paraeducators, but the reasoning behind the putback and the reasoning behind where we are with the paraeducators is to try to factor in, uh, and the school committee has talked about this, who's front facing with students. And so that was the point behind getting the paraeducators in kindergarten back um, and certainly contractual obligations are also a big part of the discussion. Um, so while it's certainly been a way that we do business and it's certainly been a productive way that we've done business, having all of the paraeducators, this is, you know, you guys know it as well as I do. These are tough decisions. Yeah. You have to make decisions based on what's going to have the best impact on kids. And I feel like that was the paraeducator conversation that we had amongst ourselves. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know that Ms. Uh, Dr. Doxer, you, you had a comment? Yes, I actually, um, I wanted to throw out a question for discussion, and I'm no longer sure how I feel about it, but one of the things that's been running through my mind is that we got this number from the finance committee about what we ought to be working our budget to fit within, but the options that, that we might want to go before town meeting, well, respectfully submit to FinCom and the, the town manager a different budget with the explanation of why. So I'm not saying that I necessarily want that anymore. I'm feeling much better with the putting back of the paraeducators. But I'm wondering what the committee and the public feels about whether we should not try to fit into this downsized budget, whether we should say that we really need some of those other priorities because my concern is is that we squeeze into the budget this year then we're looking at next year and people are saying that we fit we made it happen with a smaller budget this year then why can't we do it next year and we're just sort of digging ourselves into a hole that our students are suffering from and our staff are suffering from so I just want to make sure that the reality of the cuts and the compromises that are being made are really under, and if we can't live within them, or if we shouldn't live within them, then maybe we need to ask our meeting to make that decision. And then there are also under compromises that are being made. Thank you. Um, comments from the committee? Comment from the public? Sure. As a parent um, who sort of sat through a lot of the processes this year, it's become clear to me that in some of the presentations that for several reasons I have questions about whether or not my kids are able to keep up with kids in other districts in terms of where they're getting, they're scoring on MCAS scores, and sort of the resor all of the resources that are available for them. And I think ultimately what it comes back to is that I, as a parent, am end up going to bearing the cost for that. Because one, I'm going to have to look them in the eye and ask myself as a parent, as a member of the town, and say, am I doing the best I can to give uh, my kids and the other kids my kids can interact with the resources that they can use and need to be the best that they can be? I don't know that I can do that right based on the meetings that I've been to. I think that I worry that we get sort of boxed into, we look at numbers, and there's a lot of money here. But sort of a lot of the conversation that's happened tonight and in the prior is sort of saying, well, how do we sort of shave this corner and shave that corner, and how do we do with a little more of this and a little less of that to sort of get, scramble together things that we need. And I think Based on some of, the, based on the information I have and that's been provided, I think that it's clear that there are additional resources needed. What those resources are, I think those are topics of discussion and where they come from and all of that, but I am clear on this, 
that as a parent, I'm going to pay for it, whether it's through taxes, tutoring, you know, if my kids fall below certain lines, then there are costs and so that are going to come off with special education. And I don't want to put my kids in a position where they're not having to not only learn new things, but catch up on things that they didn't get. And so I'm doubling their workload when they're just kids. So a long-winded way of saying my push would be as a parent, speaking for myself, it's sort of say, hey, I don't know that we can fit within the existing number that we're being asked to stay. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just wanted to add, because I read the recent article on the Reading Advocate that came out. I didn't attend the FinCom meeting, but it sounded like one of the things that came out, or at least in the article, was around the amount of the free cash. And I know we had talked about in our budget meetings that um, you don't want to use it as a regular practice, but I think if we're sitting as a taxpayer and somebody who's kind of new to the process of learning about all the different finances in the town, you know, is there a hard decision that needs to be made about using, knowing that we're sitting on a large amount of it right now um, to make a lot of these cuts? Or are these cuts that we can, you know, handle this year, but thinking of next year, you know, is that the year that you have to think about the amount of the, the free cash and the AAA bond rating and, you know, thinking about having to have a new strategic plan around that. Do you mind if I give the broken record response really quick? Sure. Any money that we ask to take out of free cash to fund our operating budget is money that we're going to have to take out again next year. It's, it, it's not going to solve the problem. Uh, that FinCom, that financial forum was fantastic. We got approval to uh, move forward with asking town meeting to fund portables so that we can do a better job of full decay. It, it was a remarkably successful meeting. Um, it doesn't matter. I, I've done this budget now for nine years. Uh, we never have enough money, ever. And it was really bad several years ago, and it's never really not great. It's never, you know. um, every year, the school committee is going to be faced with we don't have enough money for what we want to do. And personally, I look to Dr. Doherty for guidance on what we should be doing and what we need to do. So again, I'll use your, I'll use long-winded, long-winded way of saying. I don't feel comfortable going back to the Finance Committee and saying, hey, we want just a little bit more. I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I think that the FinCom didn't come up with that number arbitrarily. I think they're doing everything they can to make sure that the town is fiscally safe. Is that okay? So I, I disagree a little bit with, with going back to them. But again, that's why there's so many of us here. This is what? I, I think I also really heard you say, maybe this is the dialogue for next year. And I think that's you know the imp important point, and that's why we, I think all of the, at least the three of us have sort of voiced you know we don't uh, feel like it would be appropriate necessarily to go back to FinCom, and I think so understanding where we're going to be for next year is part of the part of the thing here. But I think that's why it's even more important that um, more people who are in in the community who are interested in like the vision of Reading five years from now and ten years from now need to keep participating in the conversations. And, um, and this is just a really hard spot for, for us to be in. And it, but it, it was, I, I, can, I can't even express how hard it was the year, I, I think I was on the committee year, the year before the override, right? Because I, I was engaged in those campaigns and knocking on doors. And it was, I can't, I, no, I know I don't think Kathy was the principal. I went to the schoolyard, and people were, and it was hard, were yelling at me. I left the schoolyard, dropped my kids off, and I was, I was in tears. It was, it was, I don't ever, ever want to be there. That's why it is really good. As Chris said, the discussion in, in the financial forum was, re, is really about, we have some really, really important and hard decisions to make before we, because another year of this, and it will become structural, and that's where we were. So I, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to that. Appreciate your input. No. Mrs. Broski? Not to belabor the income topic too much, but there's one fact that I'd like to throw out there. Um, the finance committee, I feel, is deeply aware of the challenges not only the schools are facing, but also the town is facing. I was, um, I served on the finance committee 
three, four years ago. And I remember when we upped the amount of free cash that we used to stabilize the operating budget from 1 million to 1.3. It was a whole big discussion. Is that sustainable? Can we do it? It was a year or two ago they went up to 1.7. So they are every year increasing our use of free cash to try to not force service cuts on the town in suicide. So I, I just would like to put that out that they're, they're deeply sensitive and trying their hardest. I feel like they're they're using free cash as much as they possibly feel like Steve, I had a question about the structural piece. Is I thought I had heard a conversation that next year that the budget projections stay where they are, that we'll be looking at some potential structural cuts. And I just want to check in that is that true? We'll have to present the balanced budget next year to the town manager. So uh, depending on the number and the guidance received from FinCom, right now we're projecting that there's going to be some significant cuts. Is that, is that a fair statement to start? Yeah, I mean, this year the re we, we're getting essentially a 2.75% budget. Next year, I believe we saw figures the other day, it's going to be under 2%. <coughs> when you have contractual increases that are going up higher than that, and you see the cuts in reductions and restructuring we did this year, you know, you are going to, we are going to be making cuts next year. I wanted to put that out too, but I also wanted to sort of put out, I think paying attention to the structural cuts is important, but I'd also sort of encourage everyone to sort of look at what's student performance and where are we, and what's, how much of that do we want to use that as a performance measure? Thank you. Mrs. Joyce? It might be too early to ask this question, but have you looked at what those cuts might look like? Do you have any sense of what would be cut? I mean, just to, like, you know, you know, you're talking about staff and teachers, but I mean, like, where does that come from? Like, do you have any sense of what would be cut? It, it would be classroom teachers. I know, but like, I don't mean to say what specific teachers specific exactly. Line. No, like, I guess within a department, because how could you, I mean, do you cut a physics class, or do you cut, like, as there, there aren't any extra classes. That, you know, like we're not taking Latin for the heck of it. You, you know, so how does that how does that work? Those are conversations that, that we would have with the, the principals. You know, if we're if we're told that we have to cut a million dollars, and I'm just using that number, I have no idea what then we would have to figure out how we're gonna cut a million dollars. And where you we've made a lot of restructuring and reductions this year, which we can't go back and do again next year. It, it's personnel cuts in the next year. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how that impacts this, you know. Oh, class sizes will go up, yeah. programs will get cut. I mean, those, those are, that's what's going to happen. When you cut teachers, you, you either cut one of two things. You either, your class size is going to go up, mm -hmm. or you cut whole programs up. This, uh, if I could bring us back, just for a second. This is a good budget. So, and, and, I, and I really appreciate some the newer faces and the energy and the concern. This has been by far the, the, one of the more interesting years that I've ever spent on the committee. Uh, interesting, <laughs> I use that term loosely, um, exciting. Uh, this is a good budget. Uh, Dr. Doherty has managed to put some things that move the district forward and that's such a corny statement. But we have those curriculum specialists, if, if the committee sees fit to it, those are things that are gonna make the district better. So to think that he's actually able to cut the budget but still move the district forward with minimal cuts, in my opinion, this is a good budget. Reading should feel good about the state of our schools and their kids are learning what they need to learn and are moving forward. So I don't want to be all doom and gloom if that's okay. I, I, I feel comfortable with this budget that Reading is still in good shape for next year. And there's going to be some really difficult conversations next year at this time. But I, again, I'm great to Mr. Arena. Uh, a couple questions on the budget document. On page 64 of the document is a table of enrollments from uh, fiscal years 11 and 12 through uh, fiscal 16, 17 estimated. If you look at, you make the assumption that most kids in first grade will end up in second, most kids in second will end up in third, and you compare year to year, you get, and that table is not in this document, I, I did it. Um, 
there's some there's some what might be just straight mathematical errors. For example, if you go to um, the 2014-15 year in grade one, it describes that there's 298 kids. The following year for 15-16, it describes in second grade there were 353. That's a net increase of 51 kids, 55 kids. In any other year comparison where I do the same, you get minus one, plus one, minus two, plus two, minus five, and plus five. But you expect some puts and takes, kids drop out, kids stay back, kids move. Um, that one year is extraordinary. It's, it's head and shoulders above the other. Likewise, if you do the same compare between second grade in 2014-15 and third grade in 2015-16, you get uh, 31 children, much different than any other year compare for second and third grade. So this, in that year, 2015-16, there are, and I'm happy to share this table with the, the board, there are what, are what could be just simple math errors in uh, the comparison, or it could be absolute truth. But Is this table figure 40? Yeah. Okay, uh, figure 40 on page 64. Yes, I just want to make sure that I'm looking at the right thing. It's the one that shows enrollment K through 12 for six or seven years. Well, the the information that that started the 2002-2003 school year through 2014-15 is our actual historical information. The last two years that are included there are footnoted. That's in, from an enrollment projection report that was done back in 2012 by a consultant. Um, we haven't done an enrollment analysis as a district since we, 2012. Yeah, yeah. So um, and these are actually the last two years on that enrollment report. So um, I appreciate what you said and, and there's validity to it. The, this table was presented as part of an enrollment study that it was for historical. It, it was the projection based on the last time that we did it. So if I understand what you're saying, through 2014-15 it's either actuals or year to date. For 15, 16, and beyond, it's a 2000. It's based on, the, it's footnoted there, projections based on okay. Reading Public School enrollment projection okay. report from Dijon and Healy. Okay. When, when we develop the budget, John, to determine, and elementary is usually the one that we have to be most cognizant of, we're looking at, at current enrollment. When I'm not looking at this chart. I'm looking at what's sure. in the schools <laughs> right now. Sure. I, I would have thought the 15, 16 would have been your best guess at what the enrollment would be based on 14, 15. If it's this an earlier study, that makes perfect sense why there's a gap. Um, in a similar light, if I look at um, the budget on page 30, differences in fiscal 14 versus 15 full-time equivalents, compared to the same data on pages 123 to 136 for a few of the schools, for example, Coolidge, which is on page 134, the, there are small variances for the FY14 FTEs versus FY15 FTEs. Um, and the only reason I bring it up is sometimes it's, it's multiple FTEs, sometimes it's a couple tenths. But any sort of error in that regard, you wonder if it's just a math error or a spreadsheet error. I'll uh, just make it, I'll bring it to your attention. Can, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I was looking back before. Can you repeat it one more time? Sure. Let me, uh, Go to Birch Meadow. If, if I could answer some of those questions. Sure. So there's some things that have been going on in the district, and you mentioned Birch Meadow. So we have been transferring a program from Barrows to Birch Meadow over the last right. few years, um, which it's a special education program. So you're moving paraeducators and teachers, which is part of that FTE. Coolidge is the same. <coughs> What we're seeing at Coolidge, we added a program this year called the Compass Program. It's a special education program. Usually when you see an increase in FTEs in a school, it's based on one of two factors. Either where at the elementary level, it could mean that you're adding a teacher for a grade, uh, such as Eaton for next year, or you have a transfer of programs, or you're increasing special education paraeducators that are connected to an IEP. That's usually when we're seeing an increase in FTEs. I may be saying it um, badly. The same data appears to be presented twice in the document, on page 30 and again on pages 123 and 136. The same data is presented differently. What should be the same number is actually two different numbers. Um, it's probably an error on my part, though. 
because this is a table that was developed by me back in 2013 okay. that is extremely difficult and manually updated. So it's a red so control problem. Munis doesn't, Munis doesn't, doesn't generate do this. this. Okay. So, um, and I pointed out uh, there were a number of questions from the school committee regarding FTE versus actual FTE and, and it's as a point in time for some of this, like for FY15, there might have been a position. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do. So I, 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 well, I appreciate your comment. I, there absolutely could be an error, yes. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it's not very scientific. It just says it was FY14 in one spot. It, it should agree with FY14, the same data on a different page. That's all. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Well, then, so, okay, but the salary are the salary numbers. Those, I, that, those are in that table. Those are actual, some actual. Well, obviously, the prior years are actual, and then you have the budget of the for 15. Yeah. The salary numbers are accurate. It's just the FTE calculation is sort of right. Can be subject to a point in time view, actually. You're absolutely right. uh, Additional comments from the committee and, and absolutely from the audience? Mr. Robinson. John, Mark, but can, can you just uh, go over the rationale again behind me? Uh, I apologize for asking on the substitute cut. Sure, I think there's a question, you know, questions that, that capture that. I think there was in question five, we talked about more color on the substitute teacher um, discussion. So <laughs> it was. <laughs> um, some of this was looking at. Um, the number of days that, that we are funding for um, for professional development and the, the information that I tried to include in the, the answer to the questions, um, I was trying to address a number of things. Build rate was one of them. Um, but if we are shifting the paradigm on how we have professional development in the district with the assumption that the coaches are part of the budget going forward, then we're not going to have students, uh, excuse me, we're not going to have teachers missing days to go out of district for workshops. So the number of PE days is going to decrease. So, so there's a direct, there's direct savings there. Um, and then I think that you know through conversations with the leadership team on how how we use substitutes when we have substitutes um, to support different activities within the, within the building, um, there's some some changes that have to happen there as well. The, oh, sorry. The other thing that I wanted to point out is I, I tried to break out for everyone um, the amount of the budget. Um, so the, the substitute line is, is twofold. It's the daily subs within the school district budgets, within the school's budgets themselves. And then there's an amount of money that we hold back at the district level to cover long-term subs. And um, it's difficult because when you look at the trend in the book, you see you, you may be inclined to think that we didn't spend as much on subs. But we record those long-term subs, the people who are here covering the leaves of absence. We record them as teachers, because that's how we report it to DESE. One of the things that I want to do going forward is just set up another account so we can capture them, we can actually have the data and not have to go back and try and tease it out. But back in um, FY12, if you look at the answer to question five, FY12, we spent about $102,000 on long-term subs. FY13, we spent 84000 That jumped to 138000 last year, and it's it's currently kind of coming, I think, close to 140000 this year. We've had a couple of really tough years where we've had um, multiple teachers that have been out with, right. with serious long-term illnesses. So part of our thought process is for FY16 was restoring it back down to the FY12 level. Um, so, so you have a sense as to how much of, of that amount is tied to the if the, the coaches, uh, the coaching positions. So if those, if we have those, how much of, uh, or if we didn't get to have those, how much of that 
reduction, would we not then have, yeah. have a sense for that? Um, I, I want, I, I think I cleared it out here, but I, I think it's about... Um, did that make sense? No, it, it did. I understand what you're saying. So if, if we reduce our professional development, um, which is about five, annually about 500, 540 days a year, it's $95 a day for a sub. It's, that's 51,000 of the 137. The other portion of it was was being captured by reducing what we put in for our long-term to cover it illnesses. So that it was a combination of the two to achieve the $137,000 reduction. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Discussion this evening. Um, we can we can do one of two things. If the committee is satisfied, it is willing to uh, wants to start talking about approving this budget and moving it forward to the town manager. Um, we, we can certainly start taking motions and move to approve the budget. Um, if there's changes we want made, um, now would be the time to instruct the superintendent to update the budget. Um, if the committee wants further time to reflect, we can reconvene this meeting on Monday evening. Um, there's, uh, the, the town manager has been uh, very uh, open to giving us as much time as we need. Uh, we had originally wanted to get this budget to him this evening, uh, okay. uh, but with the snow and with the changes, he's been very accommodating, and we thank him for that. Um, my fellow, oh, and I, I Dr. Doxer, I'm sorry, I, I certainly didn't forget you on the phone. If you had had questions, I'm sure you would have piped in. Yes, yes, I would have. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think that I wanted to reinforce what Dr. Doxer said. I think that it's important to have to also be included in that is all of the work that the principals and the other central office administrators put into it. It was a lot of hours spent in, in district leadership team meetings talking about this budget, more so than, than I have, we have in our, in the other five years that have, since I've been superintendent. Thank you. My bad. No, 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 that wasn't a criticism. <laughs> I wanted to make sure if the right people got credit. If, if we ever do make motions and actually approve this budget and move it forward, there's a laundry list of people that we really do want to thank, including the budget parents and several others. Yeah. As soon as we're there, though, this is well, this is your process question. Okay, so if we're going to talk about this, and uh, are we going to have like amend a change and vote on it and then vote generally if we, you know, um, Process, whether it's tonight or Monday night, whenever. Mm -hmm. Is that the process? Cool. No, you. I just say when when you vote, you're voting. You're actually taking six votes. Right. You, you're actually you're taking seven votes. votes. Mm -hmm. You're you're voting on each cost center and town facilities yes. and then the overall number. Um. You vote? All right. I mean, I, I, voting on the overall number seems redundant. Not sorry, but. I don't remember doing that in the past. I just remember voting on each cost center and then voting also on the town filter. But okay. I thought we could do a moment. Maybe I just want to use the word done. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Roberts. Uh, yeah, I just will go on record. Uh, I know 
want to vote tonight. I, uh, I like, well, you've been around me long enough. I like to think about everything I heard uh, and would like to have our vote on Monday night. Be nice to start out at seven, seven nine. That, that uh, there is, uh, Mrs. Borowski, did you have anything? I, I've actually got my hand. Let me see it again. <laughs> uh, Mrs., uh, Dr. Doxer, did you have an opinion? No, I, there's just mine for me knowing that I will be in my seat on Monday, but I can go either way. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Knight? Um, no, it's a good okay. Um, are you available by a phone? No, since we're getting good at it. <laughs> yeah, that uh, said, though, I would like to make an amendment. And since I won't be there, can I do that? Oh, but there's no motion to make an amendment, Ron. Might I suggest that I wait, I was going to offer just a couple of other choices. Uh, can you, can the committee meet earlier? You can say no, you're about to no, no, okay, pretty much gone. Oh, oh, Apparently, you guys have jobs. That's fine. <laughs> um, with that said, if you would like to make a, a comment and go on record with a comment that the committee will take under advisement Monday evening, yeah, you're I more would, than welcome to do that. I would, I would just, I would like to um, uh, see that the um, regular day budget is adjusted to accommodate um, the, the math. You know, it's right and right not but make sure it's correct. But. Uh, I'd like to see us level fund paraeducators at the minimum, so I think that would be uh, an increase of uh, 27. Uh, 60. Well, no, we have to six, 60,000, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to say we're going to go back to last year's budget. So last year, so we're not going to cut completely 60, we're going to cut it. Oh, interesting. So. But you would, you would be, you know, yeah, that's not level fund. They'd well, level service. Yeah. They, they'd have have to to well, level <laughs> services to keep them, yeah, well, keep the current. Keep the same amount of money in the last year's. So and that's level fund. fund. That's what I said. Yeah. Can I ask a point of, of clarification? You're saying, again, you're the same number we used last year, and I wish I still had that page open. Uh, carry that forward to next year, mm -hmm. uh, acknowledging that there will still have to be some There's cuts. Still some cuts. Understood. But there would be. I'm looking for an increase of approximately twenty-seven thousand dollars. So what does that? The number is seven twenty-four now. Yeah. Seven twenty-four. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm not, uh, not saying to do that. I'm just saying whatever you feel you need to do to make that happen. Thank you for that. We'll certainly take that under advisement. Um, Mr. Ruff, can I? I'm not trying to muddy the waters. I'm just trying to think of a night uh, that everybody's going to be here. Uh, and also being respectful of the our, our requirements for town. So, and, and posting and all, all that. So, and your schedule as well. Uh, well, I, I think there's another piece. Yeah. yeah, she. With whatever you do. Whatever, whenever you vote on the budget, yep. you need to add a week to that before it goes to the town manager. Because we have things we have to do to this budget. So all I, I was basically going to add a day. I was going to say, what about Tuesday as opposed to Monday? Uh, I just. Again, I, I want to be respectful of the committee and. Yeah. The committee can do that. Not my report instead. So to can't cancel Monday, change the meeting from Monday to Tuesday? Um, yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, there are other meetings. Is the question on the table about whether we can do Tuesday versus Monday? No, unfortunately, there's conflicts in the superintendent's schedule. Oh, sorry. That's what I'm So, um, again, I. It is what it is. I have to be there. I actually had other people change their schedule. I saw that I would be there. I get it. Go back and say, sorry. I get it. Um, I, my recommendation, with, sorry, uh, my recommendation would be that we hold the meeting Monday night in the finalize it Monday night and we give them more info, enough time to get it prepared and to get it in front of the town page. Yeah. Okay. So if we do that, so um, are we, uh, Gary has asked that John go back and look, look for a uh, reduction somewhere else. And then you're going to present that, and we'll be able to dialogue about that. Or uh, I, 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 don't I, I honestly, I have to be. I don't know if I can find. That we'll, I'll have to go. We'll have to have discussions with the principals. I don't know if it's possible because this is an extremely tight budget. So I just want to voice that I, I just don't, I don't see that as um, a priority. If it's going to, again, how much time, more time is it going to take? I don't think that. I think that we've added um, a good portion back in. I, I can't honestly say that if I was going to put, you know, $40,000 more into the budget, that that is really where I would think it's the biggest priority anyway. I, I, I just want to make sure we're, we're going to ask people to go out and do some more work and spend a lot more time. And is that is that really what we want to do in terms of value added? Or do we just want to have go with the proposal as Mr. Nyan has made it to say that um, to take it out of the revolving. Uh, I mean, if that's what the proposal is, that's what it is, and then we can just we would have to dialogue about that. Mm -hmm. the, well, the kindergarten I, 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 that was his suggestion, and uh, so I'm just trying to understand, you know, what that where that puts you in terms of an action between now and next week and what engagement that means with staff and if that's, you know, a whole nother dialogue of, and what are we looking for here? I didn't do the math. So, $27,500. I doubt an anonymous donation is going to come in between now and then because that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So, um, Not unless it wants to come in every year. Right. So, I, you know, that's, I just want to be cognizant that that means that if we ask John to go back and do that, that's a dialogue with the, his leadership team, and that takes time to do that. For I, I don't know. I don't know that I heard a lot of. Um, I heard a lot of. I think from the staff, uh, the recognition that the seventy-five thousand dollars and adding some of the folks back in was good and important, but I don't think that I heard people saying we really still need you to add those other powers back in. I, I heard people speak more about, you know, other aspects of 
some of the things that were important to them. Could you address that first? Well, the principals are here. I, I think, yeah. <laughs> I'd be happy to answer the question. Um, we, we did, we spent a lot of time looking at this budget. We have spent hours and hours looking at the budget and deciding where to cut. And as you know, we are the, one of the lowest per pupil expenditure districts in the state. It's not like we have, we're throwing money around, because we're not. Um, we are running the schools extremely efficiently and there aren't extra bodies floating around we don't have people sitting around waiting for something to do or in the teachers room having coffee so in looking at the budget when we went and cut the pairs we cut to the bare minimum I mean that we did do the the original um, $60,000 amount which for us would be a challenge to run kindergarten with less than full day pairs um, to not have the, um, it would be, realistically, it would be me covering my secretary's lunch. Um, there isn't anybody else floating around to do morning coverage when kids are dropped off. It's me. So there isn't any place else to cut. To put um, some of the para hours back in, we have all had that conversation about, yes, we're comfortable. The, the biggest focus for us is to have the support in the kindergarten classes with the students. So if we have to cut regular ed hours other places, as long as we can still cover lunches so that kids are safe and can enjoy their lunch and recess time with enough supervision that we have para support in the kindergarten classrooms and that we can cover um, the secretary, anything else we can <coughs> deal with. I was a teacher for 10 years. I did my own copies. I was fine. I, you know, it's, we want to be able to provide the support where it's needed most, and that's with the students. So our focus is going to continue to be to put the people that we have in the buildings working directly with the students to provide support for them. Thank you. But I just want to clarify sure. that I didn't really ask for cuts. I just said potentially look at the uh, revolving account, the kindergarten revolving account. And, and I would say, too, that I have been in elementary school for 25 years. Uh, I would contend that um, you might tell the students not to come until 8, 10, but they will come one way or another, and some of them have to be out there watching. That might be... Oh, I know. They come in at quarter of eight. I know they're there. So yep. that's not going to change. So that, you know, right. the fact that you have paraprofessionals ready to go out there, I think, is key. And I think for a safety standpoint, you're, you're not to dismiss that you can't do it, but your eyes alone can't see everything. Absolutely. So, I absolutely agree so with that piece. You know, I'm, I'm looking at this from a safety standpoint as well as an education standpoint. So that's my, my comment. I mean, you can leave it as it is. Uh, act on it, but I won't be here Monday night, but um, I just want to make it clear how I feel about it. I think it, um, yeah, $60,000, maybe we can't do it, but I, I got to think that, you know, $27,000, I also look at some of the offsets that we've had from grants, um, maybe that could be good pulled unless that's already accounted for somewhere else, but I'll look at it as the question. So, um, anyways, that's my, my contention. Thank you very much, Mr. <coughs> yeah. So, I, can I ask I, a? I, you can, and I don't. No, my, my other question is, if there are any other requests like that, sure. I think it would be helpful if we had those on the front end, um, rather than the committee coming uh, back Monday night saying, right. "Hey, by the way, we want you to do this." It right. would be really helpful to Martha and the planning if there are numbers like that that are going to come from the school committee. It would be great if they could come out now or within the next you know, 10 hours. One last one. And I just want to echo what I've heard from other community members too. Is when we met with John to go over this year's budget, I was floored. Like, wow, how would you do this? I know you worked hard on it. I don't want it uh, to be appearing that I'm you know, not appreciating the hard work that we by all of you. But I just think that you know, this is something I feel is valuable. I know in the past we've cut them and we put them back, and um, inevitably they, they're, they're needed. And um, I just think, as, as Chuck said too, it seems like it's typically the first one we go to. And I just need to play a key role. And, and uh, you know, we are obviously going to make some cuts in it, but, um, but I do appreciate the hard work you're doing because I was going into that meeting with you and my colleagues and friends. Because it was uh, I mean, uh, I would have. And uh, I was.
shot you to pull it off. So, you know, my hat's off to the work that you folks did. I just think that that's one area that I would like to see. Mrs. Okay. Webb. Okay, I just want to say that Again, if, if we were going to add $27,000 into this budget, I'm not, I'm still not sure that that's where I would add it. When I look at the unfunded requests and, and sort of, and I guess this is the discussion, not the Munis spreadsheet, of the unfunded requests the district needs, I think there's things that in my mind would bubble up higher and the reason that I haven't didn't put I didn't put forward any of those you know how about a half of an FTE at the high school for the kids who are at moderate moderate risk for not progressing beyond ninth grade you know why not put a half FTE that's 20, 27,000 bucks maybe sort of well why not put that in there because I don't realistically think there's another spot in the budget for the 27,000 to come out of but I, other, because so I'm not going to give you I'm, you know I'm not going to give the list that I, I would really want to look to give because we're not going back to Fincom we've made that clear we've got a big problem in 2017 and I just don't see the other places so that you're going to cut it from I mean, I don't, should we give you the list of things hey by the way don't also cut these other things when you're looking for the 27,000 because you know, we're not going to support that I don't know I, I just feel like the list is, is long, and I'm not. I'm just not hearing the or the priority beyond what's already been added. Back. And just to, to to go back to that, I I do think that my thought is primarily looking at for school coverage. I think that's a safety consideration as much as I think we need some of those other <coughs> that we talked about. So we don't we don't even use them now. Gary, for it's not school coverage. Parents do not cover the building in the morning before school. We have our before school program that parents pay for their students to attend, but there is no para coverage before school. So, so if that funding is put back in, it's not going to at that because it doesn't Kids are dropped off at quarter eight, no one's supervising them. There is no para coverage until when, when, 8 10. I mean, 8 10, sorry. 8, eight 10. Right. When the kids are dropped off, then yes, they're supervised, but if if this is reinstituted, it's not. We're not using Paris right now to provide before school coverage. None of the buildings are. No, not to my knowledge. I, I, can, speak, I can speak to Joshua Eaton. If you drop off in Joshua Eaton, is different. We have eight o'clock. If right. you drop off your child before that, whether there's a parent in the building at quarter of eight because they're there having a cup of coffee or something, the children are on their own. That's the parents' responsibility, not the schools. Mm -hmm. And we get weekly reminders that you're not supposed to drop until mm -hmm. eight. And so it's, it's the yeah. parents' responsibility, not the parents'. I have parents that come in, like they'll come in and sit with their child yeah. until five past eight or 10 past eight, and then there's adults on duty to watch. But up until that time, there is no supervision for kids in the morning unless you're in the before school well, program. That in the past, it was. That's why it's no, that hasn't, that hasn't, hasn't been the case years. for about three, four years. Yeah. And at Eaton, it, the reason why it's eight o'clock at Eaton is because of the traffic. unique traffic pattern <laughs> that we have on Oak in summer. Probably the best way to put it. Unless <laughs> <laughs> well, I did an excellent job plowing Oak Street. Yeah. Really, they did do really they did do a good, good job. job. I'm letting you know Mrs. King did not plow Oak Street. <laughs> 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 I, I was pleasantly surprised. No, they, did do, good, they did do a good job. Uh, well, regardless, I still think that, you know, we funded it in the past. I do think they're paramount. I do think that uh, having 27 would be beneficial for students and teachers, however they use. Thank you. Okay, so uh, again, it goes back to if we if we want the superintendent to come back with a budget that's taking money out of revolving funds to make up that twenty-seven thousand dollar gap, we can ask him to do that. So we can prepare Monday night. If the committee wants to go back to Dr. Doxer's original, um, did we increase the overall budget by twenty-seven thousand dollars? That's absolutely something the committee can do. Um, if those are if those are items still left to discuss, then I would say let's adjourn until Monday night, and we'll pick it back up. If the, if the committee feels as though hearing from the principals and hearing from the administration uh, that that isn't an effective use of our money for next year, and you want to vote this evening while we're all here, we can do that as well. So I guess I, I'd almost like to take a roll call and say, do we want to wait for Monday evening, or are we ready to proceed with the vote? 
and I'll just kind of make eye contact. So can I ask you for clarification? Of course you can. It's very difficult for me to hear people that aren't in an immediate circle, and so I can hear that Mrs. King was talking, but I could not hear what she was saying, although I was thinking on every word. I you know. I, <laughs> I'm going to always keep with Mrs. King. Mrs. King was just making sure that the committee was aware <coughs> that paraprofessionals are not used uh, at morning uh, drop off time at any of the elementary schools. Before 8. Okay, and yeah, before eight was there opinion shared in terms of the pool that would be left by that $27,000 not being used to replace the para educators? My, what I heard from the building principals was that there would not be an impact on student learning and teaching next year if we proceeded with this cut in para hours. That's what I heard, and I heard it, and I, and visually I'm seeing principals nod yes. So that the, the putting back of the $3,000, I mean, it was close to 50000 of the parent. That helped satisfy the need. 75. 75. 75. So, so again, putting back the $75,000 into that para line item satisfied the building principal's desire and, and hope for para hours. It also made the RTA happy. It did not it did not satisfy the RTA request, and I'm doing this on purpose so that this is on record at this point, but it, it did make the RTA happier. Okay, thank you for clarifying. No, no, I think it was actually helpful. So I am comfortable with that cut if the principal and the RTA are feeling more comfortable with that. Not looking elsewhere for Twenty-seven thousand. Thank you. Uh, my only my only concern is that between now and next Monday, we this Monday. Well, I mean, next. It's next. what's today? It's oh, today's Thursday. Thursday. Okay, between now and Monday, that. If, you know, to have the administration and the staff look for the $27,000. The, the move would be to ask the administration to take $25,000 out of the various revolving funds to cover the gap. The, the, the ask is not to have the superintendent go back and find a line item where he can cut $25,000. That's the that way I've heard it. I know, I'm just saying, again, I don't know why I'm the translator, but that's what I'm hearing. Well, that's, uh, I, I, then you're then you're boxing. Then by saying that, we're boxing him into the the solution. Why are you looking at me? Yeah. <laughs> so I want to wait. If, if I could make the following comment, the only hesitation I have with waiting till Monday night is out of respect for Mr. Knight. So that yeah. that is absolutely the only reason why I would rather vote this evening. Then wait till Monday night. Mr. Nine deserves to oh, vote have, on the whole budget. Yes, Mr. Nine deserves to have his vote recorded in this process, and so that really bothers me. That's the only reason why I'm pushing even remotely to say, if the committee feels comfortable, let's vote this evening. If there's anyone on this committee that does not feel comfortable voting this evening, let's wait till Monday night. We're wasting our time. So th that's where I stand. I I'm prepared to vote on the budget. I don't plan on making amendments to the numbers. Just throw that out there. I am also prepared to vote. Thank you, Dr. Doxer. If there are other committee members who, it only takes one. If you guys don't want to vote tonight, just say it and we'll make a motion to adjourn and we'll be done. Chuck already did. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, I, I feel I didn't realize that Gary wasn't going to be here. I appreciate this consideration. I, I will say that I'm ready to vote, but I, I can understand that people are not. Um, it's a big <laughs> My it's concern a on your vote is that we can be here another hour knowing, knowing your vote. But I'm okay with that too, Mr. 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 Mr
I think right. you can get forward right. as an amendment. If it's not upheld, then it's not upheld. I'm not ready to discuss it any further. I just made the amendment. It's all done. It's Ms. Strowski, I haven't heard from you before. Thank you. No, I've been listening to all of this. There's um, one aspect of the budget, and it's what I referenced earlier, that I am still struggling with, and sustainability of creating two positions when, as we have said, unless there's a change in revenue, which we do not know that there will be, we can't, we might all want it, like it, and advocate for it. We don't know that it's going to happen, which creates two positions that I do not see myself supporting cutting teachers or classrooms over protecting these positions because they don't directly serve students. So that's my struggle, and that's what I think I would prefer to have the weekend to contemplate and think during and comfortable with. That being said, when I weighed against not having a complete committee here, I agree. I, I'd rather vote this evening. I also feel like I heard from the administration that even if these positions existed for one school year, we feel that there would be value. And if that's true, then I could get comfortable with it. That's, that's the big caveat. That's why I would defer to the administration. I blank. Is that a week till Monday night? No. <laughs> I never get on the phone. It's so awesome. <laughs> it was really good, too. Thank, thank she, like, came around. I was ready to fight back, but she came around. No, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, if, if it means we're all here to vote, then I, I'm comfortable voting. Well. Mm -hmm. Did Mr. Ryan make an amendment? We haven't made, no, so made a motion. Yet. So I guess I. <laughs> Is uh, what would be the measurable? Uh, so you said that if the, the positions work for a year. Well, how how are we going to judge that a year from now? Yeah. Well, we can't use that as a criteria. What I'm saying is that unless something changes, we're looking at a dire fiscal. The word that's been thrown away hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of tax. And when I look at two positions, while I think incredibly valuable, and I don't want anything that I'm saying to be perceived as not valuing the positions because I do, I think they're the right way to do professional development and I get it. But I also know that if a year from now, and I'll still be on the committee, um, we are having to cut hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't see myself saying larger class sizes and cut programs, but not the instructional coaches. I think that positions that don't directly serve students will be the first thing we're going to have to look at. I'd, I'd like to pair educators this year. And I just, that is my, do you create these positions knowing they're not sustainable, or do you create them and really, really hope they're sustainable? That makes me really nervous. Um, even as employers, the District of Reading is an employer to employ people and not know that we can sustain those positions ongoing scares me. Um, but I'm balancing that against, I get it. I get why we need it. I totally, 100% get why we need okay. it. And I get why it was a priority that was moved from unfunded to funded. Um, yeah. I, I, um, I appreciate all of that. I, I might make the comment that if we vote to fund these two positions, I don't, from everything I've heard, these won't be the first two positions that we cut. Uh, it, oh, I'd like to hear a question. Would be even, I mean, if the cuts are, as you said, more drastic or dire, I mean, wouldn't we use the same logic and say, why would we put any paraeducator back to 75,000? Or why would we put the Joshua Eaton first grade teacher when class sizes might have to go up next year? I mean, part of it is we have to deal with now, now, and later. I mean, I mean, I, I get the pain that you could deal with as well for next year, but I think why wouldn't we extend that logic to other positions that we're because they could also be uh, talked about next year. And so, I mean, I feel like we have to provide the support to our teachers in terms of professional development. We're trying to do that the best way that we will have with the funding that we have. And then if given circumstances next year, we need to look at everything again and do that again. Mm -hmm. Probably around $100,000 for me. And 
if we don't do the user fee. If right. So yeah. can you put that in the context of sure, prior yeah. years? Or yeah, absolutely. Um, I think years where of, we've used a lot of offsets, like 2009, and um, did we use a lot of offsets those years? Yeah. Yes. I remember, like before you um, passed last year, we used a lot of offsets. That mm -hmm. year. Um, question 52. I, I did include. budget, right? Yeah. So question 52, I did try to include what we had used for offsets year over year. Um, in FY12, we used uh, about 296,000, so that's revenue. We used about 289,000. FY13, we used 330,000. FY14, we used a about 300,000, the expenses is 360 gold, and that also includes donations that you know, comes in dollar for dollar, goes out dollar for dollar. Um, you know, the, the, the roll forward is difficult to do because it's two years. It's all of FY15, which some of us know. You know, we know what we took in for revenue for football season and, and what we've taken in for user fees for the first two sports. Um, what we don't know is how much we'll use for the, the offset, but what we've budgeted to use um, for this year, I believe it's 335. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, 330, because next year it's going up to 308. Right. So, um, you know, it, it's it's difficult to roll it forward. I mean, certainly, if we don't include increase user fees, we will start cutting into it. And we typically, the opening balance for our revolving fund was 175 thousand dollars at the beginning of this year. You're talking two years out from now that you're going to have it be potentially at 100,000 if you're using the offsets that we budgeted, which I think last year we did use very close to the budget yep, offset. Yeah, we did. So I think it's, it, it certainly would still be healthy. It's $100,000, but if we're cutting into it at a rate of 50,000, then you're two years out from a user fee increase or a year, maybe it's a year delay on the user fee increase. Can I just ask a question on this answer? Yeah. So it's that if I look at that right, it means that in 2012 the revolving account had a gain of 6,200, and then 13 a loss of 58, and 14 a loss of 14. Correct. Okay. And not a loss. It's just we. we <coughs> used no, the balance drops. We yes. used more yeah. out of the revolving account than what to cover the expenditures than mm -hmm. we took in for revenue. Yeah. So, um, we're talking about impacting that significantly by not, if we don't raise the fee. Correct. I think the other piece about that is it puts us, you know, it, it, it makes it deeper the next year. In 2017, without raising, you know, we won't have that increased fee. And so, in ter terms of revisiting everything, where we're going to be in a worse, a, a, a more damaging scenario next year. Yeah, it's it's similar to the amount of cash reserves that have mm -hmm. been used every year that you start at that number right. to, to for the next year unless you cut that number down, which means you're making reductions. Mr. Crusoe, I have a question. Certainly. So does that mean that if you were not to increase the dues or the fees, and it should come out of the offset, then would we have enough money in the next bid cycle to start the year, but it would just come to the place where we have no choice but to raise fees? Mm -hmm. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes, uh, Martha is shaking her, is agreeing. Yeah. We would, oh, I'm sorry. The, the no. Linda, if I could repeat what you said, it sounds as though would we, yeah, would we have enough money to, to start funding the next year? Which we would still have enough money to fund to begin funding next year. You know, the, the figure 105. I, I used a revenue projection FY16 of four hundred thousand dollars. That included an extra fifty thousand dollars of revenue, assuming that we're going to get. You know, incremental wow. revenue from a user fee from the new from the increases. Yeah. So, so if that, so if you were to look at that table and say, okay, well, fifty thousand comes out of that, our offset is still staying at three hundred eighty. The ending balance, instead of being one hundred and forty-seven thousand dollars, is going to be a little bit under a hundred thousand dollars. It's going to come out dollar for dollar. 
um, can we start FY17 with $100,000 in our revolving fund? Absolutely. Um, it's something that I would want to watch much more closely of participation and, and things like that because we could very quickly find ourselves in a situation. And I, we certainly couldn't budget an offset of 380000 to it if we started with 100000 So there are other things that would have to be taken into consideration for FY17 when you're developing the budget for FY17. Can you just sorry? Can you just so you're saying on, on that figure 105, the athletic activities, mm -hmm. you would you, if you don't raise the fee, then you have to decrease the revenue to 350. Correct. And you're still and this has a, a, currently a usage of 380,000 mm -hmm. in offsets. Is that in offsets or that's offset an offset. fees? That's an offset. And that's an offset. We also take the, the other column there, the other expense, we also take in donations okay. to fund coaches, and those go out dollar for dollar. So that's, that's also those are the coaching that revenue. The, the $400,000 revenue forecast for FY16 is a combination of user fees, uh, athletic ticket sales, and donations. It's all free. But one of the assumptions in there is a fifty thousand dollar increase, mm -hmm. a fifty thousand uh, dollar additional revenue from an increase in the mm -hmm. Question mark. Can you remind me? I have another question. Go ahead, Dr. Jackson. So, if we were to wait this year out, not raise the fees, and plan on raising those fees for the next year, would that? On the state, or would we be for the next year in dire straits? Sorry if I'm making you repeat yourself. No, it, it's okay. Certainly, we can wait a year to do it. Uh, your revolving fund balance is, is going to be lower. Your opening balance. We, we typically like to have a, a healthier opening balance in it, and. You know, you will have to do another fee analysis to see what the appropriate recommended increase would be. Which might be more than what we're asking this. Correct. Mr. Bell? Thank you. So, um, it was question 52 again. So, the balance in the kindergarten, uh, well, the kindergarten tuition is involved in approximately 655000 and um, it seems like every year there's been that gain. How much did we take out of that involvement account this year? In FY14, 665000 no. <coughs> Yeah, no. How much did you take? The budget for this years? year is... 820 820 and the budget for next year is 870 Yeah, no. Did we take money from the revolving account to offset some of these... Uh, we're increasing it for next year's budget. We're increasing fifty thousand dollars. So eight hundred seventy. So eight seventy. It's eight twenty this year. It's eight seventy next year. We've already increased that offset. We're not using funds for that. Then I'm not following. No, we're proposing next year in the budget instead of eight twenty that we're taking eight seventy. So we're we're already proposing to use. To take so you're 50, taking 50,000. Right. And is that pretty standard practice to have $655,000? And that seems like a lot. Well, part of the year for 2014. And considering we're increasing student population, but not Well, don't we get next year's kindergarten, all the kindergarten numbers are the same. What's changing is where they are. So our enrollment is pretty much staying the same next year. I thought we were anticipating it to be higher going forward. I mean, currently right now I know it's the same, but I thought we were No, the next year's, it's within one student right now from this year. Next year's is one student difference. I thought I heard that we were going to expect additional. Uh, we're expecting additional students. I mean, we do have some that, have, that are on a waiting list, right, Linda? Before they kindergarten. We've told them that right now we can't because they went past the deadline. So I guess that just goes to my point of potentially using that fund that we brought in. I think the danger there is that we have 
We're not taking in eight hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue from the development fund. We're taking in roughly seven hundred thousand. We've been budgeting uh, to take eight hundred and twenty thousand, and next year we're budgeting to take eight hundred and seventy thousand. Um, I know that we only took six hundred and fifty-five thousand last year, but we may have to take all of it this year, and we'll definitely have to take all of it next year, based on how tight this budget is. And, and you always rely. We we would never be able to decrease that. So you'd rely on 870 next year. If you increase it, you're going to rely on a higher number next year. You have to start at that number. Mm -hmm. So that is we raised that leg fees four years ago. That, yeah, I that, believe so. Yeah, I think it was four years ago. <laughs> and and rise was five years ago. And there's been no discussion of that yet. They're the, lining up at, to get into rise. The, the, the reason at this point, I don't know if you really can increase it for next year is because registrations have already started. Yeah. We, and we've already uh, publicized that, that registration fee, the fee. If this is something, I mean, if next year to have this conversation, we should we should have it in the early fall. Well, we had enough foresight to have the athletic discussion that should have been brought into the same it, discussion. Well, because a committee member had asked to have raise a raise athletic fee. No, no, no. To have a conversation about athletic fees. Elaine had brought up that we needed to talk. She wanted to talk about that, which is why we did that presentation. We didn't, in, in November, we never said to increase athletic fees. It was only in this budget that we proposed that. Right. Um, I guess I'm asking you, though, why didn't rise? Why wasn't that on the table? Because the so registrations had already started. When you started doing the budget? The yes. Rest? For kindergarten, and remember, we had already started the registration process for preschool and kindergarten. It sounds as though what we what we'd like to have happen then is let's take a look at the rise tuition for next year. Early enough that if the council decides to raise it, we can publicize it. Absolutely. But I agree. I well, I thought we had the budget discussion starting in the summer, uh, in se September. And, uh, I didn't know we, I mean, isn't that when you start uh, strategizing as to what you're going to do? And, uh, I'm, I, I guess I'm confused. We, the athletic fee discussion we were having in November. Right. Registration had already started for kindergarten and preschool in November for next year. So I, I think we're off cycle for when we... Yeah, athletics is different because athletics starts next August. Kindergarten, we already <coughs> started collecting registrations for next no, year. I, but so when you were having your budget discussions whenever you started them in the early fall, you weren't discussing raising athletic <coughs> fee at that no, point? No, no, we you were not. You were doing it based on our feedback? No, we, we didn't no, we didn't know what the deficit was going to be until financial forum, don't forget. That's when we were told you go with a two and a half percent budget. That's when we started figuring out, okay, how do we do this? You're saying if, if we were going to make adjustments in the rise or the, full day kindergarten. Kindergarten, full day, um, tuitions, we have to discuss that in no, a I different guess. cycle. I, yeah. okay, I just wanted to. I mean, you could even have it this spring. Mm -hmm. We may have passed our window. And Mr. Nine, I mean, I'll leave it to you. You feel comfortable in having the, the committee vote Monday night in your absence? It okay. seems to me, just listening to the conversation, the question, it seems like there's a lot of people not ready. Really Great. I'm, I'm going to ask then if we can, I'm going to ask if we can adjourn. Uh, Mrs. Engelson, there, there were some uh, gifts to accept. Can they wait until Monday night? Do you know if any of those are present? Okay, uh, I'm going to ask the yeah, question again. I'm sorry, but. What what is it that the committee needs from us for Monday night? Because I I guess I'm 
There's no talking in the audience. Excuse me. Start the motion and then move to the floor. Start moving there. Okay. So we'll move to approve the FY 2016 school committee approved budget in the total amount of, well, the total amount is 41,000, 41,472,366, but we will approve it in separate um, categories. Do the cost centers, yeah. Cost centers, the first one being administration, which is 925,790. Is there a second on that first motion for the administration cost center? Is there discussion on the administration cost center? All those in favor of the oh, sorry. you get a roll call. This is a roll call vote. Mrs. Barosky? Yes. Mr. Nye? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Dr. Doxer? Yes. Mrs. Webb? Yes. Mr. Crusoe? Yes. The motion carries 6 to 0. Okay. The next cost center is regular day, which is Currently 24,397,646. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there discussion? There is. I'm not asking to increase that. I'm just asking to look at revolving around and allocating approximately $27,000 to bring our educator funding to last year's level. This year's level. It has to be a specific motion on the dollars. Twenty-seven thousand. Twenty. Yep. Five hundred. I don't think it was even five hundred. Yeah, five hundred five. So the the amendment would be to increase the regular day cost center by twenty-seven thousand five hundred and five dollars. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost repeating what Mr. Nine said, just for clarity, and then we can correct it yeah. if it's incorrect. And Mr. Nine, you're you're. you're the further amendment was guidance was to take that money out of a specific revolving account. Kindergarten. Kindergarten revolving account. I come up with twenty seven thousand fifty six. How can you do that? I didn't think you could sorry, I didn't think you could take how can you take you, out the kindergarten yeah. revolving account and it's per So Yeah, yeah. It, you can't take it out of for general powers, it has to be I don't we have know. general powers that work in the kindergarten program, so I would say that would be the case. You're not increasing the, the cost center. Right. Because the, the bottom line has to still be the same. What you're doing is you're increasing an offset. Right. That's your, that's, I think that's yeah. your proposal. Yeah, right. Should we reword the proposal to well, increase the... It's an amendment to the motion, actually. No, my motion was not to increase the budget. No. It was to right. maintain the budget, but to offset the kindergarten revolving account to accommodate 27,056. Okay, the first motion, the main motion is on the number, yes. right? And then there's an amendment within that to say, to change the amount from what's currently yes. here, yeah, yes. right? Yeah. So Gary's amendment is mm -hmm. to uh, Prove that number. increase the paras, the para by the 27,600 and increase an in offset, right? I believe that's 30,000. Yeah. yeah, you're not increasing the cost center dollar amount, you're increasing, increasing the offset. The line item, right. paraprofessional <coughs> line item from 724,000 to, is it 751,000? 751,000,000. Can I ask for a clarification? It, as soon as everyone here is clear, we will absolutely pass that So the amendment is to increase the para line item in the regular day to 751.844. And to do that, you're going to increase what? The offset in full day kindergarten. In the kindergarten, we call the income. Uh, did you want to use your number, Mr. 27,844. Yes. Maybe a better way to put it is you increase the offset to accommodate 
the increase in the, instead of coming up with numbers. The numbers. Okay. All, yeah. Okay. Because all you're voting on is the cost. Yeah, of the okay. Again, so sorry, I, uh, I'll try. Um, the committee is not. This amendment does not affect the regular day total of twenty four million three ninety seven six forty six. It's an adjustment of um, the, the full of the kindergarten offset, increasing the use of that offset, offset, taking that money and putting it towards the power line item. Although I, th I think um, it's just clearly the amendment is to increase the power line item, item to 751,844 and, and increase the an offset adjustment to account for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Zine, are you comfortable with the way that was worded? Absolutely. Are you, I am actually asking for advice. Dr. Doherty, are you comfortable with the way that that is worded? Worded, yes. Okay, thank you. Is there a second on that amendment? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Browski. Is there discussion? A clarification? I would oh, I thought, uh, would it be helpful if Mrs. Webb read the amendment? So I'm comfortable with the amendment. Oh. I was just wondering if 24397646 had already the 75,000 added back into the asking. Yes. The yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, the overall okay. regular day number. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we adjusted those numbers this afternoon when we found out. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Good question. Dr. Doherty. I just so the committee is aware, you're going to be tapping into this revolving account with this vote by $77,000 the next year, more than what it is this year. The 50 plus the 27, or 24, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I sorry, though. I, Which puts you at about $900,000 as a starting point for FY17. I don't want to. I do want to prolong this. Can you explain that one more time? Meaning, we had we oh, had right. put as, you already we had already put fifty Thank as you. an increase. Now you're gonna now you're gonna add twenty seven thousand more. And right now, the full day kindergarten numbers are the same essentially. Understood. Thank you for that clarification. <coughs> Further discussion from the committee. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is take a roll call vote on the um, amendment as um, identified, Mr. Martin. We'll do a roll call vote. Which way will we say? Well, yeah, we'll go this way. Mrs. Webb. Uh, no. Dr. Doxer. No. Mr. Martin. No. Mrs. Webb. No. Dr. Doxer. No. Mr. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Nine. Yes. Mrs. Browski. No. Mr. Caruso. No. The motion uh, fails. The amendment does not pass. Further discussion on the original motion. Seeing none, this is another roll call vote. Mrs. Webb? Yes. Dr. Doxer? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mrs. Browski? Yes. Mr. Crusoe? Yes. The motion carries 6 0. Ready for the next cost center, Mrs. Webb? The next cost center is special education at $11,352,501. Is there a second? Is there discussion? Seeing none, okay. roll call vote. Mrs. Webb? Yes. Dr. Doxer? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Nye? Yes. Mrs. Borowski? Yes. Mr. Caruso? Yes. 6 0. And? The next cost center is other. Other. At 1,582,254. If anybody wants to know what other is, we can. It's district wide. Okay. It's district wide. It's, it's, it's athletics, yeah. extracurricular, district wide technology, technology yeah. and health. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Mm -hmm. yeah. Seeing none. Mrs. Borowski? Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Dr. Doxer? Yes. Mrs. Webb? Yes. Mr. Crusoe? Yes. 6 0. The last cost center on the school side is school facilities. Hit at three million two hundred and fourteen thousand one hundred and seventy-six dollars. Is there a second? Thank you, Mrs. Brosky. Is there a discussion? 
Mrs. Webb? Yes. Dr. Doxer? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Nine? Yes. Mrs. Browski? Yes. Mr. Church says yes. Six to zero. That? Can I say something? And I apologize <coughs> that I did not say it before you took that vote. That does not include any additional utility costs for modules. Yes. You know that. Uh, okay. Yes, but that understood by the I committee. Understand. Thank okay. you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Do we want to vote on the total I think we should, school please. budget first? Okay, so um, so move that the school committee approve the FY two thousand sixteen uh, school committee budget in the amount of forty one million four hundred seventy two thousand three hundred and sixty seven dollars. Is there a second? Right. Again, this is just uh, adding up the numbers we just voted on. Thank you. Mrs. Webb? Yes. Dr. Doxer? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Nine? Yes. Mrs. Borowski? Yes. Mr. Caruso? Yes. That concludes the school budget side. Now we'll take a motion on the uh, town, town building, building maintenance. So, the move to approve the FY 2016 town building maintenance budget in the amount of $759,043. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, Mrs. Borowski? Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. And Dr. Darks? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Webb? Yes. Mr. Crusoe? Yes. Motion carries 6 to 0. Okay, we do have two No, we're going to wait till Monday night. Are we meeting? You don't oh, need to oh, meet Monday night. Yeah, all right. Give, all right, give me some donations. Move to accept the donation in the amount of $315.19 from Wood and PTO to be used to purchase books for the Wood and Library. Is there a second? <coughs> and I apologize for that sarcasm. Every gift that we get is greatly appreciated. Second. I have to go through this one more time. Mrs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Webb? Yes. Dr. Doxer? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mrs. Browski? Yes. Mr. Crusoe? Yes. Mrs. Webb? Uh, move to accept a donation in the amount of $1,500 from the RMHS basketball support team to be used to support a coaching assistant for the girls' team. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Mrs. Webb? Yes. Dr. Doxer? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Nine? Yes. Mrs. Borowski? Yes. Mr. Crusoe? Yes. I think we do the minutes next time. Yes, that's fine. Um, I have one announcement. <laughs> yeah, I have one announcement before we close the meeting. First of all, I want to thank everybody for s sticking with us. This has been a, a great journey. I'm, I'm proud of where we've ended up, and, and thank you. Thank you for everyone. Um, I, I wanted to make a very quick announcement. This is going to be my last budget season. I'm not running for re-election in April. I know that there's been several candidates that have pulled papers that I feel very comfortable with, um, any of them taking over. So I just wanted to make that public announcement before we adjourn this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Okay. Is there a second? Mrs. Borowski? Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Cor uh, Dr. Doxon? <laughs> yes. Mrs. Webb? Yes. Mr. Cruzo. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, sign the one.